<clears throat> Good evening. How are you doctors? I hope you are fine today. Uh, I hope you are ready for today's session. We'll discuss new topics and uh, practice new scenarios. Um, today, we will, I will, we will start with um, how to explain a diagnosis. Whenever your task is to explain a diagnosis, what you need to do and what steps you need to follow and also some uh, tips and tricks and so all right will be included. So we'll start. Before we start, uh, could you please confirm to me that you are able to see the screen? I shared the screen, the lecture with you. So anyone please inbox me to confirm that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so key steps, how to do it. Whenever your task is to explain a diagnosis, they will give you a task card. They will give you a task card, okay, with a scenario. There will be um, a role written for you. Also the scenario, what it includes, patient's name and what, he, what problem he has and what we decided for him or whatever, okay? And then your task. Uh, at the end, what you need to do. You always have to stick to the task, okay? So uh, let's say that you were given um, a certain disease and uh, the diagnosis was, so the disease X, for example, and your task is to explain it to the surrogate. So this is what you need to do. Number one, you, you have to provide information about the disease. The pa patient doesn't know much about it and now you need to educate him about this disease so you have to give him information in clear simple language so you need to avoid medical jargon number two explain by drawing the information on the piece of paper if possible okay try to get use get advantage of the pencil and um, before you enter into the exam room because that will help you explaining what you need to explain and also it will impress the examiners. Then explain incidents and prevalence of the disease. Like for example, this disease is a common disease. It, it, it happens or it affects males and females equally. Usually it affects this middle age group or some, sometimes you deal with a genetic disease. It's, a, for example, an autosomal dominant disease, adult polycystic kidney disease. So you have to explain to them that this disease is a genetic disease. It's inherited in the family. Uh, it affects males and females equally. It manifests itself or it's expressed in adulthood. Let's say you are explaining a disease which is um, an autoimmune disease, which is much commoner in females than in males. So like SLE or rheumatoid arthritis. So you say that this disease can happen equally in males and females, but it is more commonly affecting females and so on, okay? So incidence, the prevalence of the disease, if you have simple information about it, and then explain the normal anatomy and physiology of the system, involve a system. Let's say you're explaining um, um, TB. So the normal anatomy and physiology of the lungs that they breathe in and out, they clear the air, they, get, they, they um, help the body to breathe in oxygen and so, but sometimes some infections can affect the lungs which is this organ which is involved in, in, in doing this function. And when it affects the lungs, it causes a disease. The lung becomes diseased. So some symptoms like uh, a cough and uh, difficulty breathing sometimes and so on, okay? So explain normally this organ, what it does simply in layman terms and what, how it, what happened. It caused this organ to be unable to work normally, therefore, so and so happen. So explain the pathophysiology and what, where is the defect? Please avoid medical jargon. It's difficult, but you have to get used to it, all right? Then explain the causes. Why? 
did this happen? The risk factors which led to this problem. Let's say you're explaining angina, for example, risk factors. You need to explain to them that smoking, for example, um, eating uh, unsaturated fats, uncontrolled blood sugar, uh, and so on. Okay, diabetes, whatever risk factors and any triggering factors. Let's say uh, you are explaining diagnosis of epilepsy and you are explaining the triggering factors. Okay, uh, what triggers epilepsy? Flickering of light, staying late at night, watching TV late at night, um, and so on, all right? Then you explain the clinical picture of the given disease in the card, in the task card, the presentation, signs and symptoms. Explain the complications of the disease, what, what, the, what may this disease cause, okay? What complications, what problems may happen, and prognosis of the disease. Explain if further investigation needed in the future, maybe. Tell the patient then when to seek urgent medical advice. You have to educate the patients, okay? And when they need to come to hospital urgently. Let's say, for example, you're explaining adult polycystic kidney disease. All right, so you have to educate the patient that this make these bags or sacs, non-functional sacs in your kidneys, they may get infected. There might, um, there might be an infection in your water work system and these bags get infected. Sometimes uh, stones may form. Sometimes uh, bleeding can happen. So if you notice any blood in your uh, water or if you notice any pain, it's, or sometimes if you notice any uh, shivering and fever, then you have to come to hospital immediately, all right? Let's say you are explaining um, whatever disease, okay, which has alarming signs and symptoms. Uh, let's say you are explaining uh, irritable bowel syndrome, okay? So you are following these steps. What is IPS? Okay, and then you have to educate the patient that if they develop uh, uh, bleeding per, per their back passage or they throw, throw up blood or they lost weight or if they had uh, unusual uh, abnormal uh, tummy pain or something, then you have to present urgently to hospital. Again, a patient, let's say with very aneurysms uh, in relation to uh, the polycystic kidney disease. So you have to educate them if they experience severe headache, they have to come to hospital, a severe sudden headache. Okay, maybe, maybe it's cerebrocnoid hemorrhage and he needs to come to hospital. So these, it's very important that you educate the patient about alarming signs and symptoms. This is that you show that you care about their safety and so. Remember, all communication scenarios have a management plan which you need to explain to the patient. What is your plan of action? What are you going to do now? So clear management plan when you explain a diagnosis of a disease includes non-pharmacological management. Of course, if it apply to the given disease, you will do it, okay? Sometimes you are asked to explain celiac disease Celiac disease is basically non-pharmacological management. It's gluten-free diet, right? Gluten-free diet, period. All right. But pharmacological management may be needed in other diseases, including non-pharmacological management. Let's say you are explaining um, um, a CKD, chronic kidney disease. Then you have to explain the non-pharmacological management which is needed for these patients, like dietary changes they need to make uh, if they have hypertension and loss all diet, okay? Any lifestyle adjustments needed, okay? If they need to exercise, like diabetes, okay? Diabetes also includes non-pharmacological management. So you have to explain that to the patient. Give them a general idea and then refer to the dietitian. Refer to, for example, if they want to enroll in an, in an exercise program, okay, you have to take, uh, give them a clear, a general clear management plan and then you refer to experts. They are smoking, so you will refer them to the smoking cessation clinic and so on. 
So remember, you're not, don't pretend and refer to the experts. The pharmacological management is including insulin, steroids, biological agents, chemotherapy, according to your task and according to your, to the disease given to you in the card. All right. If surgical management is needed, then you have to explain it. And that will be provided uh, according to, of course, the disease. If you are explaining a disease where uh, one of the treatment or management modalities of that disease is surgical management, then uh, include it. Other, if present, like physiotherapy sometimes may be needed, rehabilitation, radiotherapy, defib defibrillator insertion, catheterization, etc. All right. Then ask about the effect of this disease on the lives and provide help and support. Okay. We need it. So social issues. Why do we ask about drinking and smoking, recreational drugs? Because we need to counsel them and give them advice about it. Okay. It's important to ask about. So it's not taking social history rather than asking about social aspects. Okay and giving advice in order to uh, um, control their deer. If they are having problems drinking, then help smoking as well. Recreational drugs, a patient who was diagnosed with it's important to recreational drugs, okay? Okay, I'm sorry, it seems like my voice is not there. I'll just fix this. About so, what is meant here with when needed, discuss relevant, which means that according to your given task, okay, give the importance to the relevant uh, social issues to this in this of TB and you explain the anti-tuberculous medications. It's important to ask about drinking and smoking both, all right? Okay, you should ask about recreational drugs and so, but Recreational drugs and sexual problems in a patient who just was just diagnosed with TB is not as very much crucial and important as the drinking and smoking here, okay? What I mean is to make it more professional, you have to give the priority or organize and order your questions in the social issues uh, according to uh, their relevance, okay? Um, if they have an independence, like TB, they need to refrain from practicing their work till it becomes mere negative, right? So they have to leave their job for at least two weeks. That may cause problems. They may lose their job, all right? So <clears throat> that may cause some financial challenges. Um, maybe they have some dependents, all right? So this, this uh, is very important, okay? So uh, sexual problems, you need to ask about these, especially if you are explaining, uh, let's see, or uh, if the patient has uh, paraplegia and uh, he has impotence or, so the, the importance and relevance of the social issues should be ordered uh, um, in, in the priority when you ask, make the most relevant than the least relevant, okay? Occupational issues. Okay, I hope you hear me now. Uh, did you hear what I said or should I repeat? Was it clear what I said about the social issues and how to order your questions according to the most relevant? then the least relevant. Okay, occupational issues. 
here he asked about how the disease Okay, I'll repeat the last thing. Remember when I said that you have to ask about social issues because and the effect of disease on their lives and provide support whenever needed, you should make it uh, as relevant as possible. All right, which means that you give the priority. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, I, the voice is cutting a lot. I see the connection. Maybe I have a connection problem. Just, it seems like internet problems. Just a second. So you, you order them according to their relevance, okay? Uh, according to the given disease, you ask about the social issues and solve any problems they have according to its importance. All right, I'll show you how uh, with the scenarios. Then occupational issues, you have to ask how the disease might affect their job, okay? Like, like for example, a patient with renoid phenomena or renoid disease, let's say. And this patient is working in the fish market and they work with ice. Sob is uh, a triggering factor and a causative factor in their complaint, in their disease. All right. So uh, let's say, for example, a patient who um, is a chef, uh, but she has rheumatoid arthritis. So how does the disease affect her job? Well, it, it's causing her a, a difficult to contact their occupational health department for a specific employment advice or to get help for a specific employment advice to get help or relocation, okay? Okay, now safety of pregnancy is another important issue when you explain a diagnosis of a given disease, all right? Why should we pay attention to safety in pregnancy? Because there are some diseases which has an effect on the pregnancy. Some diseases, the pregnancy has effect on them. And sometimes because of the drugs the patient is going to take, which have some teratogenic effects on the fetus, all right? So here, explain, you need to explain the effect of the disease or the drugs on pregnancy. Effect of pregnancy on the disease, of course, if it is relevant, according to the given scenario, I'm giving you a general outline now, which applies to any given disease in the task, okay? But you have to adjust your performance according to the given disease and if whether if it's apply or not. So explain effect of the disease or the drugs on pregnancy. Explain the effect of pregnancy on the disease like cardiomyopathy, for example. If the patient's concern was that she wants to have children after a peripartum 
cardiomyopathy, you have to advise her not to conceive because that will cause extra load on her heart and it would put her at risk, her life at risk. All right, severe mitral valve stenosis. Also, pregnancy in a patient with severe mitral valve stenosis. Uh, uh, pregnancy should be uh, uh, prohibited. You should not advise her, advise her not to get pregnant unless she had an operation, for example, or her valve stenosis was managed, okay? Then uh, she can conceive. Teratogenic effect of drugs of the given disease and how to avoid them. You need to explain that because you have to ensure safety. Example, epileptic medications. You have to explain the teratogenic effect and the impact it has on the fetus. And you have to explain the precautions to the patient. The same for warfarin, the same for methotrexate, and so on. All right? <clears throat> so this slide explains safety in pregnancy, what you need to ask the surrogate. Remember, if the surrogate was a female, either in history taking or in communication station, okay, please don't forget the issue of safety in pregnancy, especially in communication station. If the surrogate was a female in the history taking station, don't forget to take gynecological history, all right? So safety in pregnancy, uh, you have to ask yourself, is she pregnant now? Uh, and you have to ask her too, of course. Is she pregnant now? If yes, let's say that the given disease to you in the task card was to explain rheumatoid arthritis. And you started to follow the steps one by one, and then you reached the uh, management plan and you started to explain the medications available medications, for example, we were explaining methotrexate. It was given to you in the card that uh, the patient has been tried on a steroid and it wasn't effective. Now you have to explain to her the possibility of starting her own disease modifying agents like methotrexate, all right? So you have to ask her if she's pregnant at the moment, all right? If yes, explain to her the importance to change her medication and start her on a safer drug during, to be taken during pregnancy, if not already done. Explain uh, what effects it might have on the fetus. That's, wh that's why we need to change that. If she's not pregnant, ask her if she's planning to have children soon. Are you planning to have children soon? Uh, yes, I do. I'm, I'm actually trying to, to conceive. So if yes, explain the teratogenic effect of her treatment, if that is the case, and the importance of changing her on a safer drug to be taken during pregnancy. If she answer that she's still not planning to have children at the moment because maybe she's busy with her work or job or study or whatever, explain the importance of being on safe contraceptive method. Meanwhile, while she is taking methotrexate, as long as she's not planning to get pregnant, then she needs to stay on a safe contraceptive drug, okay, or a safe contraceptive method or agent, okay, uh, so that we make sure that she doesn't get pregnant while she is on methotrexate, and advise her that as soon as she, when she plans to conceive, she has to come and see her rheumatologist. She has to come to the rheumatology clinic to get her treatment changed, a harm on the fetus. And then she will be sent back to her GP to stop the contraceptive method or device or whatever. And then she can conceive safely. All right, she has to understand this point. You have to educate her about that. That's a warning for her. So she knows that while she is not pregnant for the moment and she is sexually active, then she has to be on a safe contraceptive method. All right, who is going to, the, to do that? You have to send her to her GP. Her GP will keep her on a safe contraceptive. There is some extra point I would like to add regarding like, for example, drug inducers, like antiepileptic medications. So hormonal contraceptive pills will not be safe 
when a patient is on a, an enzyme inducer medication. Therefore, she needs to be kept on a safe prompt, a more prompt contraceptive method. So that's why you have to include her GP or, uh, um, yeah, GP, the, the GP usually deal with the contraception issues, okay? So that would make sure that she's not going to conceive uh, while she's taking her teratogenic medications, okay? So meanwhile, and when she decides to conceive, she needs to tell her doctor to change her on safe drug to be taken during pregnancy. Then the contraception can be removed and she can conceive safely. So take care regarding DD drug-drug interaction between oral contraceptive pills and other medications, especially enzyme inducers. For the proper contraceptive choice, refer her to her GP or her um, gynecologist, but GP usually is the doctor who deals with contraception, okay? Some jobs may be prohibited for some patients due to their diseases. So you need to suggest careers advise agencies to offer guidance regarding alternative employment. Let's say someone who will lose his job for good because of his problem, permanent problem, okay? Uh, he, he will not be allowed to practice his job because of his disease. Like, for example, a patient who was just diagnosed with diabetes and um, he has retinopathy and he, ha he has visual uh, problems and um, he was started on insulin and um, the DV DVLA will not let him drive again. His, uh, for example, his license is going to be revoked. All right. So here, uh, suggest career advice agencies they can offer guidance regarding alternative employments and training courses, for example. Another way is to contact the social services, all right? They will also help them to uh, uh, find another uh, source of income. When you do that, use a Breaking Bad News approach when doing this. So you have to show a lot of empathy. You have to do it with um, sensitively approaching the patient and the break the news in, in chunks, give them the golden silence and so on. What about driving issues? It depends on the given disease to you in this scenario. If it is uh, um, rendering the patient unfit to drive, then you have to advise them to stop driving and they need to report to the DVLA. So sometimes, uh, well, as I said yesterday, we have a lecture for uh, fitness to drive. But in general, okay, let's say that the general, as general outlines, okay, usually any side problems uh, needs to be reported to the DVLA. Okay, well, the, when the patient is driving, he needs to stop driving and report to the DVLA. Any problems related to consciousness levels? Problems related to, there are, of course, some exceptions and details, but these are the general outlines, okay? Side problems, consciousness problems, anything affecting the consciousness, either the disease itself, like epilepsy or um, unexplained um, uh, fainting episodes, for example, or um, the effect of some drugs like sedatives or like uh, alcohol, all right? Anything which uh, affects the consciousness level. Musculoskeletal problems like um, Parkinson's disease, uh, like um, um, let's say um, ankylosing spondylitis, drugs which can affect consciousness level as well, like insulin, hypoglycemia, antihypertensive medications, which uh, are causing a hypertension and loss of consciousness or any drugs affecting consciousness state. Okay. It depends whether if the patient has controlled hypertension with no hypertensive episodes or not. It depends on the given scenario. Okay. Also in history taking, when you have uh, the complaint is a fainting or loss of consciousness or uh, collapse, Okay, among the drug history, you need to check if the patient is taking any one of these medications. All right, what about regarding confidentiality? Sometimes you may be given a disease and there is an ethical com or legal confidentiality issue in the scenario. The surrogate tells you, doctor, do I have to tell my husband or a doctor? Do I have to tell my employee, my employer that I have this disease? So how would you answer? 
okay? So if the patient had a disease that will not endanger the partner and put him at risk, then it's up to the patient to tell their partner or not. Let's say a patient who was just diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, okay? She asks you, doctor, I'm married, and uh, I have a question. Do I have to tell my husband that I have rheumatoid arthritis? So rheumatoid arthritis would not endanger her husband. It will not uh, uh, affect him. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's not infectious. It's not um, uh, born to uh, blood born or something to, an, to her husband. So it's up to her to tell him or not, but advise her that, tell her that, well, it's up to you. If you want to tell him or not, it's your decision. But I think that if you told him, maybe he will be more helpful and more supportive, but it's up to you, it's your choice, okay? If the disease would endanger the partner and put him at risk and the patient refuses to tell them, like HIV or hepatitis B or C, then try to convince the patient to tell the partner and explain the importance of doing so. If they refuse, I'll a uh, reality lecture, okay? If they refuse, then I'll, there are issues of breaching confidentiality. And so this will be explained in details in uh, um, our confidentiality lecture. So the discussion about insurance issue may also arise in scenario, such scenarios. It may be So maybe discussion about insurance issue, issues may rise in the scenarios, and that is usually the surrogate's concern, okay, um, if they asked. I'll tell you what to say. So here is a question. Even if the drug used or the disease itself will affect the children, you mean the pregnancy in pregnancy or affecting how? Affecting their children? Congenital diseases. Well, uh, in that way, Okay, uh, regarding congenital diseases, usually we have a lecture for, to do uh, genetic counseling, okay? But um, testing the, um, the rest of the family or testing the patient and so must be done with consent, okay? And um, it has to be freely without pressure. The, the subject has to decide and choose to get the test, okay? Confidentiality also apply. Uh, it's confidential, yeah. Genetic testing and genetic uh, uh, diseases are confidentiality. Uh, you have to get the uh, surrogate's consent to tell uh, about the disease, to, to tell the relatives or so, okay? We're asking about informing the partner about the con congenital or the genetic disease. Well, uh, the partner is not going to be affected, okay, directly because, be, by this disease. Um, it's about their children. So first of all, you have to do the counseling privately with the patient and try to um, uh, um, persuade them to take the test if they have any reasons. I prefer doctor to leave it to the lecture because there are some details I need to explain among the lecture, okay? Uh, I will give you some uh, PowerPoint presentation first, explanation in the lecture, and then uh, I will answer your question, okay? Because I need to uh, explain some things before that. So don't forget to ask the patient how this disease will affect his life, job, family, and offer help. Ask about their hobbies and recreational activities and how the disease may affect these. When needed, adopt a multidisciplinary team approach involving attention to nutrition, exercise, psychological well-being. Advise the patient about regular follow-up. Arrange an appointment. Provide contact details of the specialist nurse. Consider the use of medical alert, bracelet, or similar as an Addison's disease, or patient on morphine, or patient on long-term oxygen therapy, and so on address the patient's concern through a direct question, then give the patient realistic hope according to the given disease. 
okay? This is just as a reminder. So these diseases require a medical alert bra bracelet, okay? These are examples, patients who are on uh, drug insect allergy, food allergies, heart problems, asthma, COPD, kidney failure, diabetes, blood disorders, Alzheimer, dementia, memory problems, breathing disorders, Addison's disease because they are on steroids, warfarin use, some rare diseases, epilepsy, seizure disorder, hearing, visual, or mental impairments, transplant surgery, clinical trial participation, autism, sickle cell anemia, stroke risk, multiple medicines. These are just some examples. We don't have to memorize them all, but there are, these are some examples of diseases which require a medical or bracelet. Let's say you are asked to explain the diagnosis of Addison's disease then uh, it's it's nice to tell the patient that we have uh, we give uh, patients who are diagnosed with a similar disease a medical alert bracelet uh, which carries their diagnosis just in case of emergency it's going to be well uh, known that um, you have um, Addison's disease so the medical uh, uh, personnel knows how to deal with your disease in case you lost consciousness or something don't forget to show empathy, sympathy, take understanding as you go. So now we'll start with practicing case scenarios, okay? This is the block for explaining a diagnosis. Yesterday I, I showed you the block um, for what you should use when explaining and, um, or when breaking bad news. And this is the block used to, to explain a diagnosis. Okay, again, this is the interview structure, and this is the uh, skills to key steps for explaining a diagnosis. All right, so we'll start with greeting the patient, confirming the patient's ID, introduce yourself and your role, establish report, establish report, set the agenda, assess understanding. Ask the patient if they have any idea or any expectations, what it might be, if they have any concerns so far. No, then do your task, okay? Explain the incidence prevalence of the given disease, the normal anatomy, physiology, explain the pathophysiology. Use the pencil and paper you have. Explain the causes, risk factor of the disease, the triggering factors, explain clinical picture. Explain the complications, including prognosis, according to the given disease. Explain alarming signs and symptoms, and when they need to come urgently to hospital if they happen. Explain if any further investigation needed in the future, and then your management plan. Assess any related social, occupational, driving issue, etc. And then take, uh, pay attention to safety in pregnancy if she's a female and her disease in this scenario may affect pregnancy and need to explain that to her, or if uh, the drugs or medications she's going to take may affect her pregnancy, so you have to pay attention to that, give her information about that, okay? And then assess if she has any ideas, concerns, or expectation. Uh, ask how this information you provided today in this meeting may, may affect her life, her job, her family, her, her uh, um, income, um, her social life, would that pose any problems uh, to her? Okay. And then summarize the discussion with your suggestive plan and ask the patient what or gain. What did she gain from this discussion today? Ask her if she's a has any questions, any concerns? Are you happy with my explanation today? Do you need me to help you in another way? Do you need me to do anything for you? Okay. And then end the consultation professionally by the three steps, which is provide contact details of the special listeners of the number two written information like pamphlets, leaflets, websites to get more information. 
Number three, provide contact details of any medical societies, any group therapies, uh, any um, um, whatever you need from that support list. Okay, let's say a patient has diabetes, give contact details of the dietitian, help him. Okay, um, also the follow up plan. And is a part of the management plan, followed uh, by a multidisciplinary team, which is made by a dietitian, a dietitian. Sometimes in the clinic, you will refer him there. So anything you need to refer the patient to, you have to include at the end of the discussion. All right, and then ask if they don't have any question, further question in the consultation. Thank the patient and wish to see him again. Okay. And be ready to deal with the okay, like um, whatever ethical issues included. So this is the uh, plan of explaining diagnosis scenarios. All right, you you may face a lot of them in the exam. We will continue with our uh, scenarios. Okay. And um, so is the voice clear now? Uh, I'll follow the practicing list, okay? And I will include uh, the doctors who didn't practice yesterday. I made a list with the names, so uh, we will follow it so that all of you get the chance to uh, practice these scenarios. Just a second. I will call uh, your names. And uh, if, you're, if you're present, attending live, and you are interested to practice, then please let me know, all right? Um, uh, Dr. Muhammad Adnan, are you there? Are you interested to practice? <clears throat> Dr. Muhammad Dadnan. Okay, uh, Dr. Ahmad Taha. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'll show you a scenario. I need you to follow these steps. I'll give you five minutes to plan your answer and then we will start, okay? Okay. This is your scenario.
Okay, I can start. Yes, are you ready? Hello. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. You can start. Good afternoon, Ms. Marcus. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Dr. Taha, a doctor in heart clinic today. Nice to see you. Hello. Uh, nice to see you too. Thank you. Uh, first of all, can I confirm you are yes. Miss Gina Marcus, yes. 26 years? Hello? Yeah. Yes, that's me. Okay, Mrs. Uh, Miss Marcus. Uh, Miss Marcus, we are here today to discuss some issue regarding your uh, condition. Is it okay for you? Yes, it's okay. Okay. Uh, did you want anyone to attend our meeting today? No, it's okay. Okay. Miss Marcus, uh, do you have any expectation or idea about our meeting today? Um, well, no. Okay, Miss Marcus. Uh, uh, I received the uh, received the letter that uh, you have uh, you had a complaint of uh, awareness of your heartbeat around three months back. Yes, that's true. And can you tell me about this? Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, everything started, doctor, um, a few months ago. I was running it at the gym okay and all of a sudden uh, i i felt my heart racing and i was getting short of breath and um then um i was seen by my doctor and i was admitted in hospital um during an episode and then i was told that i have a racing heartbeats and that i need um more investigation for it and the doctor, they, they did a scan of my heart and um, I had some sort of something they called catheterization or something. And they told me that I have um, a very tight heart valve. And uh, then I read about it on the internet and um, I don't know doctor, but I, I think maybe I need a surgery, right? Okay, Miss Marcus. Uh... Uh, first of all, sorry for what happened for you, and uh, that's right what Thank you told me. And uh, actually, yes, uh, as you know, uh, you did an image for your heart, and this image showed that you have a tightness in your one of your valve in uh, in your heart. Uh, uh, just let me draw for you the uh, our heart. Is formed of four chambers, each chamber connected to another with one valve. Okay. Yes. Uh, hello. Are you following me? Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm following. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and unfortunately, Miss Marcus, we found that uh, one of this valve on the left side, we have right and left side, is tight. Okay. And this tightness making this. Also, uh, irregularity of your heart speed and what you feel by racing of your heart speed and this some short of breath. So, uh, our uh, multidisciplinary team from our uh, heart consultant and uh, surgery heart consultant, uh, for your best of the rest, they found that the best thing for you is to do a uh, cardiac surgery for you. How, how do you feel about this, uh, Miss Marcus? What did you say? Excuse me? Hey. Our. Hello? Our what did you lawyer. ask me? The last yeah? Yeah. Our consultant yes, of heart. Doctor, please. Our heart consultant and yeah. uh, that surgery of heart consultant meet together and decide for you as a best of interest. Yes. 
they discuss your case and evaluate your case and they found that to do a, a replacement of this valve uh, as a surgery for you. How do you feel about that, uh, Ms. Marks? Well, I don't know, really. I mean, do I really need to have the surgery in my heart? I mean, uh, doctor, I feel quite well myself now. Hello? Hello? I feel better. I feel, yeah, I feel better. Yeah. I feel quite well in myself now. So, hello? Yeah. Yes, can you hear me now? Ye yes, now it's okay. Okay, Ms. Uh, the question was, uh, do I really need to have the surgery? Yes, uh, uh, at the do best of I interest. Do I really need to have the surgery on my heart? I feel quite yes. well in myself now. Okay, maybe you are feeling quite well now, because you are at rest, you are not doing exercise. But for these cases, uh, you have uh, a narrowing of your valve, uh, and your imaging your area is around only the, the wideness of your valve is around only 1.4. And normally it is more than two or, or four centimeters. So if you did any exercise more or climb stairs or uh, getting pregnant or some infection, you will feel more short of breath and more distress. So for best of your interest, they decide our multidisciplinary team for, to proceed for this surgery. Hello? Yeah, I understand. Yes, I understand. Uh, how do you feel now, Ms. Marcus? Um, I don't know. Are, aren't there any alternatives, doctor? Yes, Ziri. Uh, our consultant is uh, available. And the heart surgeon is available. Uh, if you want to discuss this issue with him. Uh, first of all, this issue just will explain for you, and uh, if you are deciding, we will arrange, sure, a meeting with the heart surgeon doctor. He will explain everything for you, too much details about the operation or the surgery. Don't worry about that. Okay. Okay. So, yes. uh, uh are, are you agree about this, uh, Ms. Marcus? Yes. Okay, okay Ms. Marcus. So I will arrange uh, another meeting with the heart surgeon to give you uh, details about this. But just I will give you some uh, broad lines about this uh, operation and uh, consequences about uh, after this. Uh, okay. We, they yes. will they will change this valve and put another artificial uh, valve. Uh, this uh, valve will be, the area is okay. Now after operation, you will feel it better. You will feel no more uh, racing, no more shorts of breath. On the other hand, uh, you need to start some blood thinning medication for a long life term. Uh, and this uh, blood thinning medication has some side effect and we need close monitoring. Uh, as I told you, I will give you only some broad lines and the details will be given later. Hello? Yes. Yeah. So, Ms. Marcus, we need to, later we need to follow your, um, some labs will be done regularly every now and then to check the correct value for your uh, blood thinning medication and uh, some uh, precaution to be taken to avoid any trauma or any uh, vigorous exercise. And uh, are you planning to get, uh, sorry to ask this special question, are you planning to get pregnant soon or? Yes, uh, I'm actually, uh, I was, Planning to get pregnant within the next six months or next year, yeah. Okay, Miss Marcus. So, uh, uh, if it, if you didn't do the operation, uh, you will feel too much tired and too much of breath, and you will uh, 
feel the difference if you did the operation uh, and you get pregnant. And uh, if you get pregnant after doing the operation uh, and you are on this blood thinning medication, you should uh, inform uh, your uh, female doctor to uh, stop this medication or to inform him. He will change the, the medication and start another uh, medication because this blood thinning medication taken by mouth has some bad effect in your uh, baby. Uh, are you following me, Ms. Marcus? Yes, but um, I mean, I'm re I don't want to go on any medications which can harm my baby. That's so that's why, why I'm asking, doctor, can I just postpone yes. surgery after I, ha I become pregnant and have a baby? Uh, actually, uh, if you postpone the surgery, uh, uh, you know, pregnancy itself is uh, making a load on the heart. So more load on the heart. And as I told you, the blood is coming from the side, from our body to the right side and be pumped to the, the left side. And already your left side of the heart, the valve is narrow. Uh, it will be more load on the heart and you will feel more tired. And it, it also will be a more risk on your baby than the blood thinning medication. And this blood thinning medication will not be given during pregnancy. We will, uh, your female doctor will change it to another medication can be given. Uh, some of them can be given oral, some can be given uh, by injection during time of uh, pregnancy. Are you okay with okay. that, Ms. Marcus? Yeah, I think so. Uh, do you Hello? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any other concern, uh, Ms. Marcus? Yeah, I was thinking about the duration of hospital stay. And I mean, how long do I need to be off work if I need to take a sick leave from work? How long does it need to be? Uh, Ms. Marcus, as I told you, this is uh, just the only broad line of uh, our management plan, uh, but the details will be decided by the multiple team of uh, our uh, consultant, heart consultant, and the surgeon uh, consultant. Uh, he's the one who will decide this duration of sick leave and how long uh, we'll stay in the hospital. Generally, you will stay for some days, maybe in uh, intensive care for one or two days post-operative and allowing another uh, one week uh, in department to uh, monitor your uh, blood thinning medication and everything. This is a mostly, but the details will be the heart surgeon uh, consult. Okay. Okay. Uh, any yes. other concern? Uh, no. Hello, yeah. Any other concern, Ms. Marcus? No, doctor. Okay. Uh, can I ask you some question? Uh, are you smoking? Uh, yes, I do smoke. Okay. Uh, I think better for your health to quit or stop smoking, uh, Ms. Marcus. Uh, if you want, I can refer you to our smoking session clinic. You have two minutes left. Okay. Are you drinking alcohol, Miss Marcus? Uh, sometimes, just socially. Okay, Miss Marcus. Uh, and uh, just uh, let me to what's your job? Uh, I'm a solicitor. What? A lawyer. It's okay. Uh, say a lawyer. Huh? Lawyer. Yeah, okay. Lawyer. Okay, and uh, what you have now it is affecting your job, Miss Marcus? No, so far, no, I don't think so. Just, uh, just regarding the sick leave and, and the arrangements for the operation. That's it. Okay, Miss Marcus, I told you it will be arranged with the heart uh, surgeon consultant. So, just to summarize. Uh, our uh, meeting today that uh, uh, you have racing your heartbeat and the imaging done for your heart 
show it that uh, you have a tight in, in one of your valves of your heart and our multi-sphere team uh, show in the best of your interest uh, the risk to change this valve with an artificial valve then uh, maybe you will need another uh, blood thinning medication and uh, there is some precaution regarding this blood thinning medication will be given for you uh, by our team uh, after operation okay miss marcus okay okay C can you tell me what you get from our meeting today? okay did you finish uh, can you tell me what you get from our meeting today uh, well, that I have a tight heart valve and uh, I must have a surgery and um, also um, after the operation things will get better and uh, that I need to take um, some sort of medication after the operation uh, which um, has some precautions with um, pregnancy and having babies. Yes. And that you will explain that fully to me after the surgery. Yes, and details will be given by the team after war. Uh, and I yes, will give okay. you my Thank the you. contact hospital number. And there is some leaflet and uh, some sites of uh, internet to read about this disease and about the operation. Okay. 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 Yes. Uh, anyone will, uh, you can drive home or I can arrange a taxi for you, Miss Marcus? Uh, no, it's okay. Okay, Miss Marcus. Any other concern? Feel free to ask me any question. Uh, no, thank you. Okay, thank you, Miss Marcus. Okay, thank you. So, what are the ethical issues in this scenario? It's good to see autonomy. Yes. Autonomy. Patient has has right to know about uh, uh, her condition and the decision about uh, doing OR or operation or no. Yeah. Beneficial will do the benefit of the patient, mal beneficence to avoid any harm for the patient, and justice treat the patient regarding their uh, regarding their color or race or religious. Doctors, uh, uh, you did very well. Okay, thank you very much. And you finished on time. You did your task very well. Uh, one thing I would like to uh, clarify one more time uh, regarding ethical principles. Okay, we have four ethical principles. In most communication scenarios, the first three principles usually apply to most communication scenarios like respecting patient's autonomy, beneficence, and non-maleficence. These three apply to most communication scenarios. But justice is not applying to all scenarios or to the most scenarios like the previous three uh, ethical principles. In some scenarios, it applies. In other scenarios, is it doesn't. So try to avoid saying justice unless you are very sure about it, okay? Okay. And that you can justify your answer because that may uh, lead to questions and the examiners start to ask you questions which you cannot answer. Okay, so safely, the first three principles usually apply to most scenarios, but justice, it depends. If you feel in the scenario that justice apply, then say it. Like yesterday's okay. scenario about mesothelioma, for example, justice apply. So you can say justice. All right, uh, unless you are sure about it, uh, if you are sure about it, uh, then uh, you say it, okay? You did very well, thank you very much. Um, just one thing, uh, the female doctor, do you mean the gynecologist? Yes. Um, I don't know if it's called female doctor like that. You are avoiding medical jargon, okay? So I think you can say uh, your woman doctor. Okay. Right? I think they call it a woman doctor. Or you can say a gynecologist, which is the woman doctor. He is the doctor. Explain it. When, if you say gynecologist, say don't bother with the 
uh, uh, term, it is the doctor who treats women. Okay. Or woman doctor. I think it's woman doctor, not female doctor. Okay. Uh, as a jargon, to avoid the jargon. Uh, then there was... Um, you explained everything very well, even the blood thinning medication in that she needs to go on an, another form of blood thinning medication, which is heparin. Uh, you meant heparin, right? Injections during pregnancy, if she got pregnant. Um, when she asked you about any alternatives, uh, you did it very well. You gave, you said that there are some alternatives and uh, the you can arrange a meeting with the a surgeon to um, explain to her the um, details of the, these um, alternatives, and he will decide on uh, on this uh, on this issue. Okay, uh, thank you. You did well. Good job. Thank well you. done. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. So now we will uh, have a break break for five minutes and then we will have another scenario okay see you after five minutes
All right, we are back from the break and we'll continue with our scenarios. This is our next scenario. And I'll check the practicing list again. Steve's turn it is. Um, Dr. Germin, are you there? Dr. Germin, are you there? Dr. Germin Hassan. You can unmute yourself, Dr. Jermaine Hassan, if you are interested to practice. Uh, doctor, um, uh, there is Hello? a problem. I'm, I'm, yes, doctor, yes. I'm on duty already. I am on duty already. And this patient, I will disturb the lecture. Sorry. Uh, you cannot practice now, you mean? Yes. Okay, no problem. I'll, you can do it next time, okay? Okay, inshallah. Okay. No problem. So we'll see. Doctora uh, Fatima? Doctora Fatima, are you there? Uh, neither Doctora Fatima can practice. Dr. Mohammed Shahbaz, are you there? Dr. Mohammed Shahbaz? Dr. Manal Fathallah? Okay, anyone doctors who is interested, it seems like not all of you are available now to practice. So uh, anyone who is interested in can do the practicing, please inbox me, I need some names. Uh, 
Okay, Dr. Barakat, you didn't practice yesterday, right? Dr. Barakat al Basuni. Okay. All right. So uh, I'll, I'll leave this scenario for five minutes. Read it, plan your answer, and then we will go on, okay? Okay. Can I start, Doctor? Are you ready? Inshallah. Okay. Good evening, Mrs. Julia. Good evening, Doctor. I am Doctor Barakat, one of the doctors in the Lung Clinic today. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you too. May I, confirm, may I confirm that you are Mrs. Julia Nelson, 25 years old? Yeah, it's me. Can I call you Mrs. Mrs. Nelson? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Mrs. Nelson, I am here today to discuss some issues related to your chest problem. Is it okay with you? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. First, do you want anyone of your family or of your colleagues to attend you this meeting to support no, you? No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. No problem. Go Can on, I... doctor. How do you feel now, Mrs. Nelson? Well, uh, actually, I I feel I feel ill, doctor. I don't feel well in myself. Um, yeah. I am so sorry about this. Thank I you. I appreciate your feeling and I will try my best to do the right for you. Okay. Can I ask you how much you do know about your previous general condition? Well, before I was fit and well and everything started one month ago. Um, I was referred um, by my G GP to the... Um, uh, respir respiratory clinic um, because I was having six month history. I, I mean, I was complaining for six months for the last six months of uh, sweating a lot at night and also coughing. And, and, and um, I started to lose weight. And um, the doctor said that I need to do some kind of a camera test to, to, to see my my lungs and um he said that there is some sort of an infection and this test uh, needs to be done to to know the type of infection and i'm here today um, as i as far as i know um to get the results of the camera test yes yes i appreciate all this suffering for you and Thank i know you. this is a hard time for you but did anyone talk to you about the possible results of this camera test and this test is done for the, the infection? No, um, they said the doctor said that it might be some sort of infection, but to be honest, doctor, I'm afraid that it might be TB. 
انا مصور سوري كان يقول لي هواي يو ار اكسبكتنج تي بي اكزاكتلي دو هاف اني كونتاكت وذ تي بي بيشنت ريسنتلي نو بات يو نو اي ام اوريجينلي فروم نيجيريا اند اي هاف سين بيبول ان نيجيريا سفرينج فروم تي بي اند اي ريمبر um they have the same problems like which i am going through right now yes mrs nelson uh, your uh, results came today uh, and they have the result now but unfortunately it came as we don't know i'm so What's sorry wrong? to tell you that this actually was to be Okay, so it was TV. I am so sorry to tell you that, but this is your results. Can I ask you how does it make sense for you? No, I was expecting it, doctor. I mean, uh... how much do you know about TV exactly? Not very much. Do you mind if I explain more? No, I don't. Please do. Do ex- explain it for me. Okay. Unfortunately, TB is one of the serious bugs that need long time treatment. Actually, it is can be so serious if not treated well. So in this condition, these bugs is catch it at first in your chest, causing some problems and some. scarring in your chest may also cause these symptoms like you have fever and sweating and fatigue most of the time also it may affect your general health and general well-being but i i i promise that all the medical team here is beside you to help you in this suffering are you following me mrs nelson Yes, I am. Uh, Mrs. Nelson, after no, this reason, Doctor, can you make me better? Can you make make me better? We will do our best to put your correct management plan to make you better. But first, okay. let me explain more about the con- this condition. This needs what we will oh, do yes, for please. you. This needs a combination of at least four drugs for two months. then you will continue on to of them for other four months also uh, you will be need to be uh, isolated at about 14 days um, to avoid this transferring this serious bug to others this is may be done in your house may be done in the hospital i will discuss this issue with you later but also what you need to know that this is not a fire disease i am sorry about this uh, medical term but you know about this no there is some diseases which may be serious to others and serious to your family this disease should be notified to a local health uh, infection control department this department will do what we call tracing uh, don't bother yourself about this medical term this is will it check your contacts in your field of work and in your house your family uh, or your close contact will be checked to detect if there is any one of them uh, has already transferred to him these bugs or not also the other thing is they will give him some prophylaxis treatment to prevent this disease from coming to them okay with you Okay. How does it make sense for you? Well, I have some questions. Yes, I am here to answer all your questions. You can ask. Um uh, So, how long will it take? Actually, in most of cases it takes for 6 months. 2 yeah. months of four drugs and another 4 months in two drugs. Okay, What? is it curable, doctor? Can you cure it? Yes, it is curable disease, but this will need uh, follow up and a uh, long time of treatment. So you will be followed up by 
your GP and also by the infection control department. And you will uh, take medication, as I told you before, four medications for at least uh, two months and another two, and two of them will continue for another four months. I see. I will come. Yes. Do you have uh, what about questions? my family? Yeah, what about my family? I have two brothers and I live with my mother and my two brothers. Um, what's going to happen to them? I appreciate this. Can I ask you if they are in good health or anyone who is suffering from this night fever? Well, apparently, like apparently they are fine. They don't have the same problems like me. Okay, in this condition, the infection control department will do for them some tests uh, to close to uh, to your close contacts to detect if they are affected or not, and if they are confirmed not affected, they will take. Um, uh, they will, uh, if they are, will not immunized or take the vaccination or prophylaxis before they will give him uh, this vaccination. Are you okay with me? Yeah. Do you have any other questions till now? No, so far not. So far, I will tell you about these medications you will take. It is like okay. any medications, has its benefits and its risks. In most of cases, we outweigh the benefits against the risk. Many in many patients, we, if the benefits is more than the risk and he will get benefit from this medication, we are giving it to, to him. So in your condition, the benefits of this medication will help you more to detect, to, uh, to cure you from this serious bug and to control your symptoms. But there are, there are some drawbacks. Do you mind if I talked about them to you? No. Yes. Uh, some of these drawbacks, is this, some of this medication affect our liver. This may cause some inflammation in our liver and increase in its markers. So also, we uh, it's some of them affecting our peripheral nerve cables, and some of them affecting our eyes. So you will need to attend the regular follow-up if you develop any symptoms of this, like blaring of your eye vision, like. Uh, numbering or tingling in your preferred sensation. Uh, also like uh, if you developed any yellowish discoloration of eye whitish, any abnormal tummy pain, you can tell us about this and you will manage the according. Okay. I am so sorry for this. I know this is too much for you today. If you need me to stop here, I can stop. If you want to ask me any questions, you can. I'm here today to help you. No, it's okay, doctor. Go on. Can I ask you some questions about your lifestyle, if you don't mind? Uh, yes, it's okay. Yes. Do you smoke? Yes, I smoke. Can I ask you how many, uh, how many for how long? Well, uh, I smoke less than 10 cigarettes a day. I've been smoking for about six years now yeah i know maybe it's not appropriate to talk about this issue here today but i'm advising you to, to, to quit smoking as smoking have many hazards one of them is affecting your chest and your chest was already have serious bugs like this so coexisting smoking will may worsen your chest or your lungs condition so it is better to stop smoking at this. If you want any help with this issue, and if you can think about this, I can arrange you a meeting with our smoking decision clinic, if you don't mind. Okay, that would be good. Okay. Do you drink alcohol? Uh, well, sometimes. I drink sometimes, yeah. Yes, can I ask you how much do you drink? Well, it depends. Uh... Uh, it's not regularly. I drink sometimes, occasionally. Yes. Um, can you tell me the average drinking per week? How many units? Mm, sometimes I don't drink at all. 
Sometimes I do drink. Yes. It's not well, fixed, doctor. It depends. Yeah. It is wise to moderate your intake of alcohol. And you have two minutes to... left. Okay. I know that you are working in a residential home for elderly people. To how much extent is these symptoms affecting your shop and your daily activity there? Well, um, doctor, to be honest, this job is so important to me. You know, as being a foreigner, and uh, I've been here in the UK for the last four years, I've been suffering and struggling a lot to get a job. And finally, I got this job. So um, it's very important to me. Yes, I know, and I, I appreciate you all you are saying, but this is important also to take care that this bug is, as I told you, this is transferable, and you at least be for 14 days isolated, even in your home in our hospital. About your occupation and about your job, I can arrange you a meeting with our occupational health worker to help you in this issue, to give you sick leave for, for these 14 days, if you don't mind. But doctor, I don't think they will give me uh, a sick leave at the uh, nursing home because, you know, there are so many people waiting for this chance. And seriously, if I didn't go to work for two weeks, they will not uh, um, let me come back. Someone else will take the job. In regarding this issue, the occupational health worker can solve your problem by finding you another job or helping you in taking this clip from this. Also, the infection control department will go there and direct also trace your contacts there because may one of them they have this uh, serious problem and the serious is serious words. But doctor, please, uh, I mean. You know, I can't uh, hear you. Um, I don't know how to say this. Hello? But I really need this job. Okay, just a second. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, but the voice is next to the problems stop. today. Can you hear me now? I am hearing, yes, doctor. Hello? Yes, doctor, no, I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes. And now? Now, you can hear me now? Yes, doctor, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. The, here is the thing, doctor. <laughs> Um, I really need this job, okay? I am the only breadwinner in my family. Uh, I really need this job. I am the only breadwinner in my family. And no one else works in family. So if I didn't worry for two weeks, and maybe there is a big possibility that I might lose this job. Maybe, doctor, please. Help me. I mean, please, yes. I, I promise you, I will take the medications you told me about. Whatever you, do, you say, I will do it. But just keep it, keep, keep this secret between me and you, okay? I mean, I have to go to work. And I, but don't tell anyone about this, okay? Could you do that for me? I appreciate what, all what you're saying, and I know this is a hard time for you. Regarding, first of all, regarding your financial issue and your financial problem, I will arrange you a meeting with the social health worker. He will help you in this issue and will offer some solutions for your poor financial problems. But regarding this uh, issue of not talking to there or not uh, tracing your contacts, actually this is not of my authority. This is a legal issue here and this is the system here. And this is because of this, this is for the sake of you first and the sake of society. This disease may affect many of your surrounds may affect your family, may affect your sisters, and may affect to that the elder the patient, patients, uh, elderly people in the house you are serving there. So for the sake of them and for the sake of you, uh, okay, we need what's to gonna happen? What's going to happen if I lost my job? As I told you, 
this is uh, the uh, task of our occupational health worker and our social health worker. They will help you much in this issue regarding your financial problem and also regarding your occupation. They can talk to them about your, the job. They can afford you another job. They can help you in this issue exactly. They will okay. find some solutions to you. If you don't mind, I can arrange you a meeting with them to talk with them about these issues. Okay. Okay. Do you have any other concerns? No. Also, I will let you some leaflets and brochure about tuberculosis and uh, this is called TB to read more about this and more read about this the medication used in the treatments and its side effects. Uh, also, I, you will be under supervision of our multiple medical team uh, from our infection control doctor, Chester doctor, your GP and the specialized nurse to explain to you more about your management plan. And I also let you the, my nurse hospital contact number. If you have any queries, you have any questions, uh, you can ask or just can talk to me. Uh, don't no. worry, Mrs. Nelson. All the medical team here is beside you and all the medical team here is supporting you till the end of your suffering. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, did you finish? Yes, doctor. I just want to check and understand. Okay. Um, so what are the ethical issues here? Ethical principles in this scenario? The ethical issues in this scenario is autonomy. The patient has the right to know every, everything about her management plan and her disease and to share also on management plan. Also beneficial yes. to the right thing for the patient. The right thing for the patient is that giving her medication and isolate her for at least 14 days. Uh, non maleficence this is, means no do no harm for the patient and also for the patient, others and the context. And the context. Uh, also duty of condor to be honest with this patient. So, yes, hello. You said autonomy, beneficence, and what else? non maleficence Yes. Do no harm for and the duty of condor. What else? Uh, the ethical issues here is that. Uh, do you think justice? Do you think justice apply here? Here. Maybe apply because of the patient is her dark races other than the race should be here. No, uh, justice applies here um, because she was asking you to keep it secret so that she can keep her job. But uh, that's not possible. She needs to refrain from practicing. And uh, TB is notifiable. We have to notify the Department of Health that this lady has TB. Okay? She should not uh, expose, be exposed to other people at her workplace because that is in the public interest. Yes. All right? So here, yeah. So here, you cannot... Uh, keep the secret and let her practice her job uh, rather than trusting her. So it's impossible. The voice is disrupted. Can you can hear you. Okay, just a second. There are some important things I need to say in this scenario. I'll fix it. I'm trying to fix the connection. Just a second.
Tatami. هات تساعدك ما لك فتح الموضوع ان له بدي اجي دولي هلا بتحمل ما في ما في تتحمل بساعة ساعة ومتفرش سنانك بالنام it's not my fault غسل جسمك بس كان فينك بدل ما تروح على البقالة تتحممي هلا الساعة ساعة ساعة الربع غسل جسمك ونامي يا بسي انا I want to write at least 300 words ابوك كاتب لك يعني روح لهم يلا معك يوارد هلا بس الايميل تبعي بكمبيوتر ايميلي انا وير ان يور كمبيوتر الكمبيوتر معك انا ما فيني افتح الايميل على الكمبيوتر يا بطاي تروح لا تجي بقى افتح لك اياه ماما نيفر مايند يس هلو ام باك ام سوري اي واز ديسكونكتد Okay. Uh, I was. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me, doctors? Yes, doctor. Hello. 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 Yes, doctor. Hello. No, that we can hear you. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, we were discussing the ethical issues. Okay, thank you. We were discussing okay, the ethical issues the, respecting the patient autonomy, uh, beneficence, uh, beneficence, non maleficence, and justice. And justice. I'm sorry, but there is a, a, an echo. Okay, just this applying the scenario because uh, uh, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, doctors, uh, let's go for a break. Okay, a break for ten minutes. I'll try to fix it and get back to you. I'm getting a weak internet and being disconnected. So just ten minutes, and I'll try to get another network. Okay. All right. Okay. We will right. be back at nine nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. يلا نامي نامي This is very little and most of مقدمة مقدمة بس هي الأرلي لايف ما لها مقدمة مقدمة الأرلي لايف ينهض على هيلة المعنى لتر دق لها بكره سالو 300 words تطلع 300 words دق لها بكره سالو Are you sure? دق لها بكره سالو
question. Yeah. Yes.
Okay, we're back. Hopefully this time uh, there no, be no more information problems after this time. Okay, um, there is an echo, still an echo. Okay, I was explaining the ethical issues or ethical principles in the scenario, the previous scenario. Okay, I'm, I muted all of you. So uh, to, just to get uh, rid of the echo, okay? Um, so whenever, if you, if you have a question you want to ask me, it, just send me a message or you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Now, there are some ethical issues which are important in the TV uh, scenarios and some questions. I already got some questions from the inbox. Okay, the first one is the ethical principles. In this scenario, there is justice apply in the scenario. Why? Because the patient was asking to keep her confidentiality so that she can still continue doing her work and not getting fired. But there is uh, uh, the issue of the public interest for the safety of the public. Okay, justice also apply here because they also have the right to be protected from getting the infection, the tuberculosis infection. So again, it's respecting patient's autonomy. All right. Um, Beneficence, non maleficence and justice. So if you want to explain and justify why justice, tell them that I um, uh, justice because of the public interest, uh, the uh, population also has the right to uh, um, not being exposed to this lady. So that, that's why I advised her to uh, have a sick leave for two weeks and can help her with doing that, okay? Now, um, the question, should we admit her or not? Should this patient be admitted or not? Well, um, admission in the hospital for TB patients is not a must, okay? If she uh, has a home and uh, she can have, uh, be, be, she can stay in her, in her room, for example, um, in a good ventilated room and so she can take the anti-TB medications at home. The indication for admitting patients with tuberculosis are either uh, uh, they have uh, uh, an indication to receive inpatient hospital, like for example, they are severely dehydrated or they are severely anemic or there is any other medical problem which needs in-hospital treatment, okay? Or for a social reason like patient is living in a hospice, sharing the room and sharing the place with other people. So here, these are indications to admit the patient according to the NICE guidelines. These are indications to admit the patients into hospital. Either there is a medical problem to treat them as inpatients because they need in-hospital care, or there is a social reason, okay? Uh, among the material uh, Dr. Ahmed sent you today, there uh, is a PDF file which um, contain important uh, uh, points and important um, information you need to know about the um, uh, communication stations. So you will find this piece of information among the material. All right. Now, um, do we need to isolate TB patients in hospital? Even in the hospital, if it's multi-drug resistant TB, then you need to isolate the patients in the hospital. Otherwise, TB per se is not an indication to isolate a patient uh, and, and admit him in the hospital. Just advise them to keep in a, uh, away from uh, mix, uh, socializing with the rest of the family and people. Okay, they can receive it as outpatients if their health is okay and they don't need any in-hospital uh, care as inpatients, okay? Um, so according to um, the performance of, um, of uh, the doctor, um, okay, there was a question about, uh, he did very well, he explained it, but I was wishing if um, you explained more about 
uh, how it is um, um, transmitted, okay, and that it is uh, contagious, um, the um, uh, prevalence, the risk factors for TB, uh, how it is being transmitted, um, causes of it, risk factors, triggering factors, explain the clinical picture of it, okay, how does it present usually, explain the complications of TB, it may lead to so and so and so, and if left untreated, although it is a curable disease, but if left untreated, it can be very serious and it can even, some people may even die if they don't get treated, okay? This is the prognosis of it. Explain the alarming signs and symptoms of TB, coughing blood, for example, <clears throat> okay? Uh, further investigation management plan and follow-up plan, you explained that, okay? And related social, occupational driving issues, etc. So the rest you did it. I just have some comments about uh, just following a bit step-by-step -step approach uh, to cover these uh, um, uh, points, okay? One more thing is that I, re I noticed that you used a Breaking Bad News protocol, okay? TB is a diagnosis, and the task was to explain the diagnosis of TB. And TB is curable, so it's not uh, uh, considered as a bad news. Okay, although it's, you can say sorry, it's, it, it's so, uh, show sympathy, show empathy, okay? It's okay with that. But uh, you don't have to do it with the golden silence and the warning shot. And because it's, it, the good news is that it is curable. Once the patient understand what she needs to do and how, what the, what the management plan is and uh, the follow up uh, uh, program she needs to follow, okay? And that it is curable. It's not bad news, all right? It's not like terminal cancer, for example. That's bad news. It's not like um, multiple sclerosis, which may end up with paralysis for the rest of her life or loss of vision. That's bad news. It's not a modern neuron disease. It's not HIV. TB is curable. So there is a difference, okay? And again, the task was to explain, uh, sorry, the task was to explain the diagnosis of pulmonary TB and how she will be managed from here on. So you just need, you, you, you just go on, you just go on with the, and uh, follow the, the, the rest of the, um, uh, of the um, uh, key steps, okay? Another question you may face, um, it's notifiable to whom? TB or the notifiable diseases are notifiable to whom? It's notifiable to the Department of Health, okay? She was uh, uh, worried about losing her job, and uh, so we have to give her an advice. She said, what if I'm going to lose my job? They will not let me uh, uh, do, uh, get back to work. Uh, they will kick me up, uh, uh, out, okay? So here, um, tell her that you're sorry for that. I understand her worries. But um, and what she should contact her occupational health office, not the hospital. Okay, when you said uh, we will contact our occupational health office, no, it's her occupational health office at her workplace. Advise her to inform her GP. Advise her to inform her occupational health uh, office for help at her workplace. Okay. And if she needs any letter from the uh, uh, doctors, if she needs anything that help her to get a sick leave, we will provide that. If she says that they will, uh, she will lose her job, tell her that you will explore this issue further and you will contact the social workers and the social services uh, in regards to this issue and they will help her regarding her uh, uh, um, job uh, uh, um, concern, okay? Uh, what else? Okay, so if you explain the management plan and then the follow-up plan. How is she going to be followed up? She will be followed up uh, by her GP and the local TB service, okay? Her GP and her local TB service, okay? Uh, the, who will do the contact tracing? Uh, the contact tracing will be done by the uh, local TB service, okay? Also, the public health uh, can do the, the contact tracing. 
but specifically um, tell her that all her contacts and family will be screened for TB to find out who these close contacts are and inform her that you will inform her GP and the local TB service representative regarding the offering of screening of these individuals and offer a treatment for the affected ones, okay? So here, you will inform her that her contacts will be screened and offer treatment if needed, okay? Uh, you will tell her that you will inf inform the GP and the local TB service representative regarding the offering of screening of these individuals and the treatment for the affected ones, okay? Now there is a question, uh, should we discuss the direct observer therapy here? Uh, well, we have a scenario regarding direct observer therapy. I will explain that in the scenario, but here uh, there is no indication to do, to start direct observer therapy, okay? The, the adult therapy should be uh, uh, in, uh, indicated in specific circumstances, all right, not uh, in, in all circumstances, okay? So that was the main points uh, regarding this scenario. Of course, uh, uh, it's good that you gave her a warning about the side effects that she, if she uh, uh, noticed that she got yellow or she got sick or she uh, uh, noticed any uh, a tingling or abnormal sensation in her um, um, fingers, like for example, or any visual problems, she should come to the hospital, uh, but she will be followed up under close observation uh, and follow up um, uh, these uh, side effects will be controlled and uh, uh, we will uh, take care of that. All right. One more thing is that she needs an eye check. Uh, we will send her to the ophthalmologist to, uh, just to take care of the vision issue. All right. Uh, you asked about the smoking. You asked about, okay, it's good. But these were the um, the uh, notes I wanted to, to say about the scenario, okay? Um, so let's go to our next lecture. So here is another scenario, okay, just to go through it. You are the specialty registrar in acute medical unit. Please read the summary and proceed to the consultation. Mr. Kiran De Silva, he's a 21 year old man. Mr. De Silva was admitted to the acute medical unit two days ago following a five day history of diarrhea and vomiting. He has been a soldier in the army for the last five, four years and has recently returned from overseas for a period of home leave he has been out with friends celebrating his 21st birthday the day before becoming unwell. The diarrhea quickly settled, but he continued vomiting until the day of his admission. Upon arrival to the ward, he was lethargic and dehydrated. His blood glucose of admission was 38.6. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and diabetic ketoacidosis secondary to viral gastroenteritis. Your task is speak to Mr. De Silva and explain the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes mellitus. That's the task. And of course, deal with any concerns, any related social job issues and so on. So you will follow the same block here. So you see, we have three examples of explaining diagnosis. Whatever the disease is, just follow these steps, okay? And please remember, don't, you don't need to use breaking bad news approach like the one we used yesterday if the diagnosis is treatable or curable, it doesn't carry a bad a uh, uh, terminal uh, prognosis like the examples we had, we, I explained yesterday. 
All right. If your task is to explain the diagnosis, just use this block. Okay? Because you will not have enough time to do both tasks anyway. All right. So in the previous scenario, you will explain the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes mellitus, the incidence, the prevalence, the normal anatomy and physiology, where the defect is, why is he having uh, uh, diabetes, okay, what are the causes, the risk factors, the triggering factors. In his case, the triggering factor was the viral gastroenteritis. Explain the clinical picture of diabetes. Explain complications, including what's going to happen if he didn't receive treatment. But the good news is that we have treatment for diabetes. It is a treatable disease. Okay, explain alarming signs and symptoms. If he experienced any tummy pain or started to throw up or having difficulty breathing or uh, any loss of consciousness or dizziness or so, he needs to come to hospital. Okay, uh, signs of DKA or signs and symptoms of having hypoglycemia, all right? Uh, like for example, if you started to uh, drinking a lot of water or passing a lot of your, uh, water, uh, then he needs to come to hospital. What other investigation may be needed? The management plan, the treatment plan, including dietary advice, exercise, okay? The treatment insulin, he needs to be kept on insulin, the follow-up management, who is going to follow him, the multidisciplinary team, right? And then the follow-up visits to give contact details, the diabetes medical society, the specialist nurses of the clinic, and so on. Assess any related social occupational driving issues, safety and pregnancy related ethical issues. He is a male, so this doesn't apply here. Okay, so you follow the same, ask what his concerns are, Okay, the occupational issue here is that he is a soldier. Okay, recently returned from overseas for a period of home leave. And this kind of job is prohibited for patients who start on insulin. So he needs to inform the army and his occupational health office there. Okay, about his recent diagnosis for relocation and further advice. That's the idea about the previous scenario. Now, Possible problems and concern, they may ask you, when you explain the diet, it could be serious if left untreated. This is how your answer should be like. Or I'm sorry to tell you it is serious if the disease is serious, but the good news, it is controllable. They may ask you, is it reversible, doctor? Yes, it's completely reversible if the disease is completely reversible. Well, it will improve, but not completely reversible. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that if, it's, it, if, if this is the case. Is it curable, doctor? I'm sorry to tell you it's not curable, but it's controllable and researchers are still going on, hoping one day we find a solution for it. Okay, so these are some examples. I've sent you uh, these uh, problems and concerns among the PDF file uh, today. There is a question, uh, when to say, our occupational health worker and when your occupational health worker. Uh, the occupational health worker is always the subject, the surrogate's uh, uh, occupational health worker. He, he should seek advice if his disease will affect his job or if his job will affect his disease, okay? Then advise the patient, the surrogate, to contact his occupational health office or his occupational health worker at his workplace. Okay, it's this uh, the occupational health office or occupational health worker, it's the same, okay? He needs to contact them for further advice and possible relocation. Maybe they can uh, uh, give him another job instead, for example, um, like you, you remember the, um, let's say a patient who has, um, occupational asthma, and he's working in the basement, okay? And there's always dust in the basement. And so they can relocate him and put him in another place, an office, for example, okay? Or he may be um, to work in a different department to not be exposed to the triggering factor of his disease. 
For example, the lady who had rhinoid disease in dealing with eyes, if she contacted her occupational health office, then um, they may relocate her. Maybe she can work in a different department and avoid dealing with eyes because that is the direct triggering factor of her disease. Okay, so it's always the subjects, the surrogates occupational health office or occupational health worker at her workplace, the occupational health worker or the occupational health office. Okay. It's not our, it's not the hospital's occupational health office. When do you say that uh, we will contact our occupational health office if the doctor or we had a colleague working with us who is sick? So here, I will explain this in the uh, lecture where you have to deal with a colleague with hepatitis B infection. Okay, and here you, you will counsel your colleague about his uh, uh, results and advise him to contact the hospital's occupational health office, okay? Because he is the patient now and he has to contact the occupational health office of his workplace, which is the hospital he's working in, which is the same hospital as yours because he's working, for example, in this scenario, he's working with you in the same hospital. So it's always the surrogate's occupational health office that he needs to contact for further advice and help, okay? Uh, another concern, for example, I cannot do my job anymore because of my illness. Doctor, please help me. So we contact the, we can contact the occupational therapist and you can inform your occupational health team. So you advise her to um, uh, com inform her occupational health team. There is a difference, of course, between occupational therapist and the occupational health team. You know the difference? Occupational therapist is among the help list. He provide walking aids or any uh, uh, additional uh, help uh, if they need. Uh, like the physiotherapist, you know, um, sometimes the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, these help people who have any musculoskeletal problems or any walking problems, uh, need walking aids and support, okay? But occupational health team is the health team which deal with any problems the disease has on the patient's job or the job has on his disease to help them out, okay? They could do your replacement, the, the patient's or the surrogate's occupational health team, they could do him a replacement with another suitable job in the same company or in the same uh, uh, place, okay? Do you like us to write to them? We can write them a letter if that helps. Will I be able to walk again, doctor? An example with treatment and physiotherapy, you will feel better and your weakness will improve, hoping one day you get a complete recovery, but we cannot predict this now. This is an example for how to uh, respond to that. Okay, will I need to be admitted, doctor? Well, first we need to confirm that you have this, for example, this is just an example, this blood clot. So we will do some blood tests, some imaging to your chest and heart tracing, and a scan to your lungs, then according to the results, we will take the decision, either you will be admitted or not. Okay, let's say that you were given a scenario and it's not clear yet that the patient is for admission or not. Another concern, I have a child at home and I'm his only carer, I cannot be admitted. We can contact the social worker and arrange for a babysitter. And I gave you another example yesterday, the lady with metastasis to her spine, and she refused to be admitted because her husband, she's the only carer of her husband. She was afraid that he will be left behind if she was admitted to hospital. So you will get the help of a social worker and they will arrange for his care. Either someone will take care of him or they may arrange uh, to have, keep him in a nursing home, for example, during her hospital stay or something. Okay, so this is just examples on how you can get use of the support groups, uh, sorry, the support and help list, which I showed you yesterday. For example, you're explaining a diagnosis of insulin and the patients say, I'm afraid of insulin needles, doctor. So you should answer that we have insulin pain now. For example, just, just an example, you will not see the needle and it will be felt as a mild scratch. You'll not feel any prick or we have insulin pump, for example. These are modalities uh, to um, uh, 
uh, improve the uh, delivery of insulin and um, it's not gonna be painful or so. I'm afraid of MRI, it's closed chamber, for example. We have an open MRI. These are just some concerns which may rise up in different scenarios, okay? All these, uh, uh, I sent you all these uh, to your email. Just check the PDF file. Important problems and concerns and how to solve them. Okay? Let's say, how long will I take these medications? Like the lady in the TB scenario. If you're not sure, I will check with my consultant. And if you're sure, I'll tell you, uh, um, tell her just it's six months or something. Okay? Uh, if they have alcohol issues. So we don't ask the cage questions. But if they have any alcohol issues, difficulty to stop alcohol, and they need to stop it, well, it's better to cut down your alcohol or to stop your alcohol consumption. You can join a self-help a help group. I can help you to contact them if that is okay with you. Would you like to do, Would you like me to do that for you? Okay, smoking issue, I will refer you to smoking cessation clinic. So all these concerns, uh, uh, just check the PDF and the answers, okay? So that was the uh, lecture of how, on how to explain a diagnosis. Now we will go on to um, the next lecture, which is how to explain a procedure or a new treatment. Uh, regarding the gynecologist, uh, what you should say, gynecologist is a medical jargon, so instead of saying female doctor, it's woman's doctor, okay? Uh, you can say the woman's doctor. Okay, could you please confirm to me that you are able to see the screen before we start? Anyone inbox me, please. Okay, thank you. So here is how to explain a procedure or a new treatment. There are some steps you can do, okay? So first of all, when your task is to explain a certain procedure or a certain treatment, there is a difference between obtaining a consent, explaining the procedure and obtaining a consent, and between just explaining the procedure. If you were not asked to obtain a consent from the patient, then you don't say that. Um, would you like to uh, sign the consent form or and so? No, just explain the procedure as a part, like the task says, okay? If you are asked to sign the consent, obtain, sorry, obtain an informed consent, then ask them to sign the consent form. I'll show you in the consent lecture how to obtain an informed consent, what you need to do. But for now, you will just explain the procedure without consenting as the task says so, okay? So when you explain a new treatment or a new procedure, you start with reminding the patient with the negative effects, the disease having on his health. Make them uh, remembering the suffering, make them realize how bad their situation is, that they are not responding to treatment, okay? Which the disease, so remind them with the negative effects which the disease have on their life 
show empathy and that you are here to help them. Okay, ask them about previous episodes of their diseases, previous relapses, the hospital admissions, okay, and their bad effect. Hospital admissions, complications of the disease, side effects of drugs, job issues that they needed to uh, leave their job because of their disease. Okay, they're suffering, they are taking medications, they're complying with their medications, but with no benefit. Then say what the best treatment or the best procedure is and use a promising tone of voice when you do that. Why? Because you're bringing them a solution. Okay, whenever you have a new treatment or a new procedure to offer to the patient to make him better, to feel better, that's good news. So you do it with a promising tone of voice, not with a sad voice like when you break bad news. Reassure the patient. Tell them they are not the only one in the world who will be doing this procedure or this new treatment. Okay, it depends. Of, of course, it depends on the procedure. Like, for example, if it was a palliative procedure, then you won't, you won't represent it as uh, the ultimate solution and uh, best uh, uh, curable option. Or It depends on the scenario. Some procedures are actually curative. Some treatments, when you start them, they are actually very good. Others are just palliative. So pay attention to your tone of voice and your body language when you do that. Like, for example, when you explain the procedure of ERCP, it's not like when you explain uh, ERCP for the terminal stage cancer or when you explain the procedure of a Hickman line to give chemotherapy. Okay, it depends on the situation. It's not like when you explain a procedure, like for example, um, um, a valve surgery, a valve replacement surgery. Valve replacement surgery is good news. There is a solution for the patient. It's not bad news, okay? So you can do it that, say, it represented as being one of the treatment modalities in, the, in, the, in active treatments in the patient's condition. So start with reminding them how bad their condition is, okay? And then say what the best treatment, your proposed treatment is or your proposed procedure is. Reassure the patient because you're bringing them a solution. Tell them they are not the only one in the world who will be doing this procedure or who will be started on this treatment. It could be steroids, it could be insulin, it could be disease-modifying agents, it could be biological agents, it could be anything address their concerns and respond to them one by one. If they have any fears, if they have any concerns, solve them, explain to them, answer the questions. Don't forget checkpoints. Uh, does that make sense to you? Are you okay with that? And so on. Like Dr. Barakat, he was checking uh, uh, the checkpoints frequently and that was uh, uh, a good point, okay? So check understanding as you go, show empathy, ask questions and concerns. Okay, you have to do that every now and then during the discussion. Then provide, don't forget to provide written information, pamphlets and leaflets and websites, draw diagrams when you explain to the patient, that may be useful. Remember to explain fully in simple terms, avoid medical jargon, don't say stoma, don't say colectomy, don't say exacerbation, all right? Use simple layman terms. I encourage the patient to meet people who did the same. If they are still refusing to start this treatment, offer, encourage them to meet people who did the same procedure or treatment, okay? Encourage them to read about that. Tell them that you can arrange for a meeting with people who did the same procedure before. You can hear from their own experience how they, uh, their opinion is about this procedure, how they were before it and how they became after it. Would you like me to arrange such a meeting for you? Okay. Encourage them to read about this procedure. Okay, arrange a meeting with the doctor or the surgeon. Still, they are still not uh, um, 
let's say they are still refusing to do this procedure or take this treatment, then arrange a meeting with a doctor or surgeon who will do the procedure himself if they are still not sure. If they still refuse, suggest so second opinion, all right? Tell them what complications may happen if they don't do it. So you will explain the procedure. You explain what it is, how the operation is going to be done or how the medication is given. Okay, is it given through tablets or is it given IV or whatever? Okay, and then explain the indication for this treatment, and explain the possible side effects or complications. Okay, but under a follow up or, uh, with our team or the, the team of doctors, you will be uh, 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 very well taken care of, and these side effects uh, can be controllable, controlled. Okay. Um, Tell them either if they uh, agree to do the procedure or take the treatment or not, tell them what uh, will happen if they don't do it, okay? Or if they don't take the treatment and how they will improve if they did it. Explain adverse effects which may be associated, all right? However, at the end, if you did all your efforts and they still refuse, you have to respect their autonomy, okay? So this is the block for explaining a procedure and the key steps. So interview structure, start with greeting the patient, confirming the ID, introduce yourself and your role, establish report, set the agenda, assist understanding and the eyes, do your task, remind them what the negative effects the illness has on their life, explain what the best management is with a promising tone of voice, explain the procedure or new treatment, use drawings if possible, indication, benefits and complications, we are sure they are not alone and not the only patient who will do this procedure. There are many people who did the same procedure before. So what do you think about that? Do you have any, what's your opinion regarding what I just explained to you? And then assess their opinion about it. If they are still unsure, encourage them to meet other patients who did the same procedure or treatment before. Tell them that you can arrange for a meeting if still refusing advice meeting, the doctor who will do the procedure, if still refusing, uh, uh, suggest a second opinion to meet your consultant, for example, explain the complications if they don't do it, the procedure or the proposed treatment, what's gonna happen, okay? And then uh, uh, assess their, I th that, that would be your management plan, okay? Then you assess the ideas, concerns, and expectations, effect on life, how would this information you just tell them affect their life and provide support, summarize with the suggested plan, and then end the consultation. Okay, this is the interview structure. So whenever we go, if your scenario, for example, you see what applies to your given scenario and follow it. This is because this is the outline, this is the key steps. You should, I'm just providing these blocks just to remind you to stick to the interview structure so that you have a solid uh, uh, frame to follow in the exam because under the stress of the examination, under the stress of, uh, I mean, the exam is stressful. So if you didn't practice a lot and if you didn't have a solid plan to follow, you you will forget things. That's why I'm repeating this block and in including this interview structure every time. So this is the scenario. Uh, I'll see who who's interested to practice. Okay, Dr. Mohamed Farouk, you can unmute yourself. Dr. Mohamed Farouk. Okay, you can speak now, Dr. Hello. Mohamed. Yes. I can hear Hello. you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is your scenario. I'll give you uh, five minutes to read it and then we will start, okay? Okay. All right.
Hello. Yes. Are you ready? Uh, yes. Can we start? Yes, sure. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning, doctor. Uh, may I know your name and the age, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm Sarah Motson. Uh, I'm 19 years old. Sarah Morrison. Yeah. Okay. Can I call you as a Morrison, Miss Morrison? It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, Ms. Morrison, I am Dr. Farooq. I am uh, one of the doctors in the gut clinic. Uh, how are you? I'm fine. Actually, I'm not a doctor. I feel sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Morrison, we are here to discuss about your health issue. Is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Uh, before we start, can you tell me that uh, what do you know about your health issue? Anybody explain to you something or? Well, um, yeah, I know. I, I have a disease which is called ulcerative colitis. Okay. I have a problem. I have a problem. It's, it's like a kind of, some kind of uh, bleeding from my colon. I'm um, sorry to hear that. Thank you. Um, and it's have been so bad and not responding to whatever medications the doctors are trying with me i'm really sorry to hear that thank you uh you are being suffering for this right yeah i mean you can't imagine how this have affected me in my life lately it's been so bad so it's it's affecting your uh, daily life and the job Yes, sure. Everything changed. I've been busy with this disease from spending my time in, in, in the hospitals, spending most of my time in the follow-up clinics. And I mean, I, I had to leave many things in my life, just um, try to find some time for my disease. I'm really sorry to hear about it. And uh, we will help you in this regard. Thank you. Um, May I know what the job you are doing? Well, uh, I'm still a student. Okay, so it's affecting your studies. Yeah. Am I right? Yes. Okay. And it's affecting your family life as well? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't have, um, you know, I, I stopped spending my time on entertainment stuff like I used to do before the disease. And... Um, okay. Yeah. What hobbies you are having? Well, uh, I, I used to work out. I, I play sports sometimes, but I, I can't do that okay. anymore as before. I'm uh, really sorry to hear about it. Uh, okay, so do you know that uh, the uh, disease, ulcerative colitis, what is this and uh, what the problem with this disease? Or you want me to explain more about it? Well, as far as I know, it's a problem in my uh, in my gut, specifically my colon. As the doctor said, I have a problem yeah. with my colon. Yeah, and it's it's causing some bleeding and having this passing this bloody stool from my back passage frequently. And um, yeah, that's that's all I know about it, or as far as I remember about it. Yes, you are right. That this is the problem in the colon. And this is causing the bleeding uh, and passing the stool with blood. And you may be facing the tummy pain. Am I right? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry for that. And uh, sometimes the people have some other uh, symptoms also. Like they have the joint pain, they have the red eyes, and uh, they have the sometime uh, yellow discoloration of the eyes or some liver problem. Are you getting what mm. I'm saying? So this disease is uh, having so many yes, pro problems. You, you understand what I mean? Yes, I understand. And you tried many medications for this one, including the recent medication, which is available very effective for patients, but it was not effective for you. Am I right? Yes. 
Okay, so the good thing is that that uh, we can do something for you uh, just to prevent the complication of this disease. Like what? Uh, that uh, your case was has been discussed with the surgeon and he planned that he will do surgery for your gut and uh, that will just uh, relieve your symptoms and the problems what you're facing day by day. You want what me to explain the surgery? Yes, please. Yeah, as uh, he, he saw your case uh, in detail, so he planned that uh, he will uh, remove the colon, okay? You yes. know the colon is the la last part of the gut, and uh, we are passing stool after that from the back passage. Yeah. So just I will draw for you. This is the uh, gut, okay? This is the small gut, and this is the large gut. Large gut is part is colon. This colon is uh, having the problem with you and having this uh, bleeding and all the symptoms. So the plan is that, that uh, to remove this colon and this uh, small part of the gut, this, the small gut will be connected to the back passage. Uh, the thing is that, that it cannot be done immediately. We can remove the colon and it will, it will take time to just reconnect this small, part, small gut to the back passage. And during this period of time, we just connect this, this uh, small gut to the skin on the right side of the tummy. What so, do you mean? Uh, I mean to say that the, the same as a back passage, there is a, we can we make the uh, artificial passage on the lower right side of the tummy to just uh, pass the stool from that and just we put the some bag over there. Uh, we technically call it colostomy procedure and we put the colostomy bag for this. Uh, don't bother yourself with this name, but we put the bag to collect this stool from this part. So you mean, doctor, that I'm going to poo in a, in a bag? Uh, actually, this is, this is for, yes. Actually, this is uh, right, but this is for a few months. Uh, uh, we'll, this is a few months time to be given to the gut and then the, this part of the gut which is connected to the skin will be connected to the back passage so then you will pass normal stool as you were passing before. So this procedure uh, initially will be done and its initial part uh, will be done and it's only the temporary for a few months. Are you getting the point? No way. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to poo in a plastic bag. No way, doctor. Uh, this is not going to happen. I'm sorry. Okay. I can understand that uh, how the, this news for you. And uh, it's uh, uh, actually that uh, this procedure is, has been done for many patients and it's, uh, they are comfortable with this. And uh, I can arrange the meeting with them and you will see that the, how they cope with the life with this one. It's in, it's will, the bag will be not visible because it will be under the cloth. Uh, so that bag can be easily changed and it's, uh, we will give the full training to you that how to just clean this area and how to change this one. And we have the, our a team expert in this one. So they will explain that how these things can be done. And you will not feel any problem with that. No, it's going to show People will see that I have a bag. I don't know. I mean, I can't imagine how this is going to happen. Um, the hygiene and the smell and the, the appearance uh, of the bag. No way, doctor. I mean, this is so difficult. Uh, the, the thing is that, that uh, it, is, it will not be visible to the people. It will be under the cloth and it will be covered. <laughs> And uh, there will be no smell because the bag is fully uh, sealed. And we will tell you how to just uh, clean this one and everything uh, will go fine with this. It, initially, it will be difficult, but uh, by the training, by the understanding, this will be okay. And just to understand that this is the temporary procedure. 
then the another procedure will be done to just uh, connect this part of the small gut to the back passage and that everything will be all right you got my point yeah but there are some i have so many questions about this i mean i can't imagine how yes please i am i'm here to answer you please well one of the questions is that i'm a swimmer doctor okay yes how am i going to swim with that bag uh this is uh, your your concern is right i appreciate your concern uh maybe for some time uh you may not uh, do this uh, swimming uh because this part is uh, uh with the bag and it will be difficult i'm sorry to say that this is it will be difficult for the swimming but some special swimming costume may be available i will check for it that is there is available you just protect this thing and uh, it can be easy i will just see that how the other people are coping with this one with the swimming with the daily activity with the exercise and i will let you know everything okay and all right so the thing is that uh, you know why we are doing this procedure because you are suffering a lot and you are not responding to the medication are you getting the point yes so if you will keep it like this it will have the more problems it will more bleed and it will have the more complication and uh, sometime it can be the serious complication like yeah. it can like it can turn to the cancer so that's the thing we want we want uh, we don't want for you so this is the best thing can be done for you uh, i know this will be suffering for few months uh, till this bag will be there but uh, you, you you will understand it how to uh, cope up with this and we can uh, explain to you everything we answer for you, all of your questions and uh, we will just arrange the meeting with the people who have did this procedure this is a usual procedure done in our hospital many patients did this one and they are doing the going, having the comfortable life coping with this and this is not a permanent as i may have to mention well so, i don't know you have any other concern please yeah one i mean how what's going to happen during my intimate time with my husband with that bag it's it's embarrassing i this uh, i think it for uh, we explain to your husband as well and this will not have any problem with that because it will not be leaking or any smell or anything so and we will explain to your husband that how necessary this procedure is for you and i think he he will understand and uh, we will help you in this regard that to just uh, let him know and uh, explain the everything okay i'll see i'll think about it i'll see do you have any other concern no Okay so to whom you are living with the at home uh, I live with my husband Okay you have any kids Not yet Okay so uh are you still in the medication Yeah the doctors have tried uh, medications with me but the, um, nothing is working yes that's the reason we are going for this procedure and after this uh, procedure you will okay. be off the medication this medication uh, may have the problem you have two minutes left uh, yes uh, miss morrison uh, this miss miss morrison this medicine may have the problem with the pregnancy so that's good that you will be off the medication after this procedure are you getting the benefit of okay. this uh, medic this surgery Yes. Okay, do you have any other concern? No. 
Okay, so today we discuss about that uh, you have the disease ulcerative colitis and you are not responding with medication, including the new medication, which are very effective for some people. And that's the reason that our surgeon decided to go for the removal of the colon. And you will do the some opening, uh, which will be for temporary in the right side of the tummy. And after some months, we do the another procedure to just reconnect this uh, part of the opening to the uh, back passage. Okay. Okay, so uh, you understand or you want me to explain more about it? No, I understood. Okay, so what we got from this consultation? <laughs> that uh, there is a solution which is better from my condition, which is yeah. to go for surgery. And that you yeah. will remove uh, the part, my colon, which is causing the disease. Okay. And, um, that I will have to have this opening in my tummy, in uh, sorry, okay. in, in, the, in the belly. And um, that um, you will help me out how to take care of it. And, uh, However, doctor, I will think about it, okay? I, I, I can't decide yet. I need to discuss this with my husband first. Yeah, I think better you bring your husband. Uh, I will uh, arrange the meeting with uh, my consultant and the surgeon, and we can sit together and we can discuss more about it. And meanwhile, we'll tell you how the surgery will be done. The surgeon will explain to you that it will be not having any uh, complications or anything. Some complications are usually happen with the surgery, but he will explain, and he's the expert one. He will explain more about this one, that what are the benefits or the side effects of this procedure. Okay. Is it okay? Yes. Okay, so. Time out. Ms. Morrison, so I, I will, Ms. Morrison, I will arrange the appointment and we'll meet together, inshallah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, welcome. Thank you. So, uh, what are the ethical issues in this scenario, ethical principles? Uh, the first of all, autonomy. That's yeah. the patient has right to know uh, that uh, all the details about uh, what's going on and uh, right to know what is the best management for her disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one is the beneficence, that the best treatment for her when she's not responding to the medication is the surgery to just remove the part because which may go for the complication and may develop sometime in long run as a cancer. So to remove that part for the best interest of her. And uh, avoiding the harm to try again another treatment which may be not effective. So we're just preventing the side effects of the medicine. So maleficence is the third one. Okay. So, uh, respecting autonomy, beneficence, and non-maleficence, you, you mean? Non-maleficence, yes, non-maleficence. Okay. All right. Um, okay, you did very well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Uh, welcome. Uh, just, uh, you, I, I felt that you were a little bit surprised with her concerns and how to solve them, right? She was asking... Uh, As, regarding swimming only, yes, yes. I was just... Uh, uh, thinking that what to answer. Yes. Uh, however, the people who have colostomy bags, they can swim with their bags. Okay. Okay? No contradiction. It's okay. Uh, no okay. problem. But if she um, is against the appearance, maybe she has a problem with having that bag and people um, are able to do it. Maybe she wants to cover it. Okay. So here, yeah. suggest to wear, for example, Tell her that there is no contradiction to swim with this with the bag. There is no problem. You can swim, but if she says that my swimming suit will make it show to other people, and it's embarrassing, for example, so you can suggest yeah. to wear a snorkeling suit. You know the whole fitting black snorkeling. Yeah. So suggest that it will cover. Okay, that's for an, yeah. as an example. The other okay. issue regarding uh, during her intimate time. Uh, tell her that, uh, as you said, it's it's tight fitting bag. Uh, there are some tight fitting bags available just for this purpose, okay, to solve this concern of such patients. So you can give her 
the uh, uh, advice and the contacts where she can find these bags, okay? Regarding taking okay. care of the bag, cleaning, and so you did that very well. You told her that we have uh, an expert nurse. She will uh, uh, teach you how to take care of it and clean it and, and so on. You, you will get used to it. All right, you did it very well. Uh, one of the things when you start to, um, first of all, you started to ask about her disease and how it's affecting her life. You did it very well. Then you go on by when you approach the issue and you want to tell her what your proposed procedure is, tell her that according to the uh, uh, medical uh, researches and according to the studies, okay, there is a very good solution for your condition, which will make you uh, uh, which will make you better. It's uh, uh, a solution. Uh, you know, colectomy is curative in ulcerative colitis, right? Especially if it is total or full colectomy, because you will remove the diseased mm. part. So even the extra intestinal manifestations will be, be get better. Okay. So, like for example, take a look at this scenario here. Okay. Uh, you are the medical doctor. Please read the summary and proceed further with the consultation. Can you see the slide now? Yeah. Okay, I want you to compare between the previous scenario and this scenario. This is Jasmine Kopta, a 49-year-old woman. She has had ulcerative colitis for more than 10 years, during which she had multiple exacerbations, of which she received numerous courses of steroids for. She's on long-term as a thioprene. Over the last six months, her diarrhea worsened, and she's currently opening her bowel more than 10 times a day. Colonoscopy was done recently and showed active pancolitis. She's fed up with her condition. Your task is to discuss her management with a view to recommend total colectomy. So again, the stoma is going to be permanent. Yeah, here, she has, yeah, here is a permanent. Yes, in the previous one, it is temporary. temporary. So maybe you get this scenario, maybe you get this scenario. All right, okay, both are okay. available. Uh, possible, sorry. So here, total colectomy means that they will remove the entire colon, okay? So uh, she will get rid of ulcerative colitis for good, the problems, the side effect of drugs, no more drugs, she will take no more drugs, no more side effect of drugs, okay? She will have no more extra intestinal infestations, okay? The risk of cancer, the risk of uh, toxic megacolon, the risk of all the risks uh, of ulcerative colitis will be uh, abolished, okay? And this is a promising... Sure, right? The only problem she needs to deal with is the colostomy. All right? But in this scenario, yeah. in this scenario, there is an anastomosis which is planned to be done. So it's going to be a temporary problem. So tell her that you have, you came with uh, a solution for her suffering, as you said, okay? According to medical researchers, according to the decision of our consultants, this is the best available treatment for your condition to control your symptoms, to make you feel better, to get you back to your active lifestyle. Okay, and so on. Uh, again, you did very well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. I can So now we'll go for a break, five minutes break, and we will continue. But before the break, just uh, just a minute here, possible concerns. Okay, maybe the patient can is uh, complains that I cannot give myself the medications. I cannot clean the colostomy or stoma bag by myself. So here we can contact the stoma nurse, for example. She will show you how to take care of the stoma bag. It's quite simple, and most of the patients find it easy. If you still feel it difficult, we could arrange for a district nurse who will teach you how to clean it and give you your medications. That's an example, all right? So here, uh, let's say that uh, you are convincing a patient about an important procedure or surgery, example, heart valve replacement this time. So I'm afraid that your condition didn't respond to treatment. In the previous example, we took colectomy. Now, I'm afraid that your condition didn't respond to treatment. You are in a critical stage now. I'm sorry, but your uh, condition went to the worst. This is with the patient who has a very severe uh, uh, mitral stenosis with pulmonary hypertension, like the previous scenario. We are afraid if you, um, for example, that your uh, uh, heart valve will be completely blocked if you don't do the surgery uh, or bleeding uh, will not stop, for example. So what do you think the team can do for you if it got complicated and got that worse? So will the team have decided that you need to do the surgery? 
I assure you that in the best experienced hands of our doctors and the advanced techniques of this procedure, complications or risks will be very minimal. As I can give you time to think about it, also if you want, I can let you join a support group in the a uh, uh, heart clinic to see how people are coping with their conditions. You'll cope better with your daily activities. You will lead an active life. It will not be a burden anymore. And there are some precautions I would like to tell you about, which is the warfarin and the pregnancy and the INR measurement. So do you accept the procedure? I will arrange the consent for you to sign if you're asked to obtain a consent in the scenario. If this sentence was not present in the scenario, neither the task, then you don't mention the consent, okay? So that was uh, some examples. And uh, we'll go to the break now, five minutes, and we will back and start with uh, how to uh, explain a chronic illness, patient with a chronic illness.
Okay, we'll continue our sixth lecture, which is chronic illness. Whenever you get a patient with a chronic illness, okay, what you need to do. So this is how to do it. For any chronic illness, you need always to address, always ask the patient about any updates or new events in regard to their chronic illness. Usually chronic patients with a chronic disease, they will come to the OPD for follow up. They have uh, a disease and they are taking usually medications for this chronic disease, all right? So always ask the patient about any updates or new events in regard to their chronic disease. Ask them about any new symptoms or any new complications from the disease or drugs. Ask about their medications. Okay, here we ask about any new symptoms. Maybe we need to admit them, right? Maybe there are new symptoms, side effects of the medications they are taking. Maybe they are experiencing any um, aggravation or the, any complications of the disease itself. Okay. Number three, ask about their medications. What medications patients? If they say they are not taking their treatment regularly, then you should uh, ask these four questions. So here, you have to assess their compliance with the medications they are on. If they are not taking their treatment regularly and they are not compliant with their treatments, then you have to explore the reasons for non-compliance. So you have to ask them why. Why aren't they taking this treatment? Try to do it without direct confrontation, okay? Like, for example, I understand the treatment needs to be taken many times a day, if that's the case, of course, in this scenario. So could that be the reason? Then ask a direct question if there are any, are any problems with the treatment, any reasons for not taking the treatment regularly. Example, maybe they say it tastes bad or it's difficulty to swallow or there are some side effects, okay? So try to know why they are not taking the treatment. Then establish their understanding, the implication of their diagnosis. Do they have enough information about the disease they are suffering from? Do they have enough information about their diagnosis? If not, explain to them what their diagnosis is. They need to understand that it's important to stay on these medications. And if they don't take the treatment, what's gonna happen? Number three, establish, they understand the implication of their treatment. So the, the implication of their diagnosis, the disease, and the importance and implication of their treatment how important the treatment is to be taken. Number four, what is the benefits of the treatment and the consequences if they don't take it? All right. Then address any concerns they have and solve them. Reassure them, find solutions, explain the risks of non-compliance, offer help and support according to the scenario, all right? So these are basically the steps. Ask the patient how the disease is affecting their life. Usually a chronic disease has an impact on the patient's life. They are living with that disease. So you have to know the implication of this uh, chronic disease on their life. If they have any financial challenges, did they need to quit their job because of their disease, for example? What about their hobbies? Are they still practicing their hobbies or do they need to stop doing them because of their disease? Ask how they spend their free time or leisure time in isolation. Did they become isolated and introvert, not participating in social events? or isn't, is that the case or not? Assess depression, ask about their mood, if they have any mood changes. Uh, what about their food and feeding, eating habits? Are they eating well as before or, or not? Um, what about sleeping? Do they sleep well or do they have any sleep problems? How are they spending the time with the family? Do they spend their time with the rest of the family? participating in social gatherings and so, or did it, did that change after becoming, uh, suffering from this disease? 
all right? Assess if they have suicidal thoughts, but avoid asking a direct question. Don't ask them if they ever thought about suicide. Instead, you can ask them, how do you see the future? How do you see your life? If they say, I see the, I see the future as bleak and hopeless, then they may need the help of a psychiatrist, okay? Because chronic diseases may have, may cause depression, okay? Uh, other, uh, here, offer support, example, financial support, okay? Discuss solving problems at work due to their disease or illness, social support, psychological support, etc. Don't forget safety in pregnancy. The same thing I explained before, the same thing you have to pay attention for. What treatments are they taking? This chronic disease and its effect on pregnancy. So in young women who wants to get pregnant, counsel them about the effect of disease on their pregnancy and teratogenic effect of the drugs they are taking. Here so let's take a look at this slide. It describes sick. That was the previous slide, which I already explained. Whenever needed, address the effect of their illness on their intimate life. According to the given scenario, their sexual life provide help. It may be the surrogate's concern. If not, you should ask if they have any marital strife. Patient with a long-standing diabetes for many years, maybe has impotence now. So ask them if they have any marital problem, any marital strife. How uh, do they have any challenges in their intimate life? And proceed from there, offer help. Example, impotence in paraplegia, for example, all right? Offer help. Like, for example, say them that, tell them that you will help them. Uh, you, you can ref refer them to the genitourinary doctor. Uh, he will um, uh, assess them and uh, uh, See how to solve this. Provide. For example, uh, there might be prosthesis available. There might be coaching. Uh, if, um, if they have any problems which uh, was affected because of this chronic disease. So uh, uh, offer help with uh, uh, Mariah, sorry, um, Mariah counselor. Hear, hear me better now? Is the voice better now? Discuss any relevant driving issues and provide advice. Don't forget to provide patients with realistic hope to help them cope with their chronic disease. Some concerns which may arise are they are afraid to take medications for their entire life. It's a chronic disease. And they are afraid to take treatment for their, the rest of their life. The answer should be, I'm sorry that you will need to take treatment for your entire life. Your condition to be careful up this is to make sure this is not happening. Okay, another concern may be they are afraid of side effects. The answer should be these, and we will keep opening, okay? So all these concerns have been sent to you in the PDF file. Just take a look at them, okay, and how to solve them and how to respond. A diabetic patient who has needle phobia, the answer should be reassure them, then explain the importance of taking insulin and that it needs to be delivered by injections. There are some av available options, insulin pen or insulin pump, where they will be barely see the needle and it's not going to be painful. Advise them about changing the needle injection site. Okay, 
Now we have a case scenario. This is the block specific for chronic disease. We will follow the same interview structure. Greet the patient, confirm his ID, introduce yourself and your role, establish reports, set the agenda, assess understanding and eyes. Then you need to do your task, which is assess updates, new symptoms and signs, assess complications if present from the disease and drugs, ask the patient how much they know about their disease. If they don't know enough, give them a brief explanation. Assess compliance with medications and which drugs they take. Deal with issues of non-compliance. Ask them the four questions I told you about. Address concerns and solve them. Reassure, find solutions, explain risks of non-compliance with their treatment. Address social, job, pregnancy, depression, driving issues, related ethical issues, etc., and solve them. Social questions are very important in, in chronic illness scenarios. Then ask, this is the effect on life and provide support. It's the same here, the social issues. And, okay, then summarize, recap with your suggested plan and end the consultation, all right? This is our scenario. Who is interested to practice? Send me a message, please. Okay, Dr. Sara, I will unmute you. Okay, uh, please read the scenario. I'll give you five minutes to plan your answer and then we will start, okay? okay. You will use this, you will use this block. All right. Three steps. Okay. okay.
Okay, we can start. Okay. Um, hello, good evening. Hello, uh, good evening. Uh, am I talking to Miss Charlotte Mickens, 25 years old female? Yes, it's me. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm Dr. Sara Ahmed, one of the doctor in the joint clinic. Nice to meet you too. Uh, we are here to discuss some issues relating to your health. Is that okay with you? Yes, it's okay. Uh, okay. So uh, first, tell me how are you? Uh, how do you? Uh, how are you doing with your joint pain now? Well, um, it's the same doctor. There is no improvement. So sorry to hear, to hear about that. Uh, so, Miss um, Charlotte, can you please tell me how much do you know about your condition so far? Well, um, before nine months ago, I was fit and well. Uh, that was where I noticed uh, that my fingers have become stiff and um, they were painful and they got swollen and uh, especially my fingers and my wrist uh, mainly in the mornings so i went to my gp and told him about about that and he referred me to uh the uh, rheumatology clinic uh three months ago and uh, he said that i have um rheumatoid arthritis Okay. Yeah, uh, my doctor said that it's still in the early stages. That, of course, he investigated me thoroughly. He did um, uh, some imaging and some blood tests, and, and then he suggested to start me on steroids. But uh, to be to be honest, doctor, I wasn't keen to start uh, treatment with by steroids by then. Um, um, I wanted to find out more about the street first. Sorry, the voice is interrupted. Can uh, I can't hear the last sentence? Uh, my GP. I went to my GP, and my GP referred me to the rheumatologist three months ago, and he said that I have rheumatoid arthritis. He said it is in its early stages. And after investigating me thoroughly, he suggested to start me on steroid medications, but I wasn't keen to start steroids because of, um, you know, I don't know. I just wanted to find out more about the side effects of steroids. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Uh, but first, let's uh, have a, a brief talk about the disease, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Okay, uh, uh, as, you t as you told me, you have been diagnosed with this uh, rheumatoid arthritis three months ago. Rheumatoid arthritis is one uh, of the defense system disease in which uh, your defense system starts to uh, attack uh, him, his, his, um, to attack your own body instead of attacking germs. Uh, and in your, in, in your condition, in rheumatoid arthritis, it attacks the joint and uh, some other, uh, uh, primarily the joint causing this pain and swelling, uh, and it, it may have to attack other organs. Uh, it has many complications, so sorry to tell you about that. Um, uh, one of them, it can cause uh, deforming, deformity in uh, the joints of your hand. That's why uh, we, we are so keen to start uh, the, the, the medication at early stage, so as to avoid uh, this deformity and other the complica other complications. That does that make okay. sense? Uh, one of these one of these medication uh, are yes. steroids. Uh, steroids uh, to control the to, to control the, uh, the the disease. Steroid, uh, as you mentioned, ha yes, uh, as, as any drug, it has many uh, side effects. Uh, it can cause uh, uh, it can cause uh, uh, some weight gaining. It can cause um, uh, high blood sugar, high blood uh, pressure. But um, 
we will keep uh, we will give you the minimal dose to control your symptoms and we will keep following you in our clinic so as to catch uh, these complications as early as possible and we uh, will give you um, the proper management uh, it, uh, it, it, it also can cause some stomach soreness it can cause uh, thinning, thinning of the bone. That's why we will give you some um, uh, stomach protection tabs and some calcium and uh, vitamin D for your for your for your bone. Does that make sense with you, Miss uh, Charlie Charlotte? Well, doctor, I don't know. I mean, um, it, it causes weight gain, right? Yes. But that's why I don't want to take steroids, actually. This is the main reason. I don't want my weight to increase. I can understand your worries. Uh, we can arrange uh, uh, some, we can arrange meeting with the dietitian so as to uh, minimize this uh, weight gain by uh, controlling your diet as, as uh, you diet too. Besides, okay, that, is that good? Is that uh, okay with you? Well, uh, well, doctor, I, I don't feel keen to start steroids. If there is any, any other treatment available, maybe I will go for that, but not steroids. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I understand that. Uh, but the consultant decides steroids are the best in the rest of, uh, of, your, of your condition. There is other uh, treatment also. We call them disease modifying agents. But they have uh, some. They have all, also their own side effects, which um, so sorry to tell you, it will be more serious than steroids. Like what? Uh, uh, some of them can cause uh, lung scarring and uh, can affect your liver. Uh, some of them can cause pancreas uh, inflammation of your pancreas, and. Um, the, uh, if you are uh, you are going to start uh, uh, to conceive, they are uh, uh, they can cause teratogenic effect on your baby as well. What is teratogenic? I okay, uh, so sorry for this. Teratogenic, I mean, um, they can cause some uh, uh, birth defect in the baby. I see. And. But Mm. Yes, but unfortunately, I, I, I'm afraid to tell you we can we may we may start to use them if you have uh, if the joint pain is not controlled if, it, if you have uh, more than ten joints affected we will we will start this uh, medication and so and so to avoid to avoid reaching this point we uh, better to start steroids as soon as possible. But I don't really, I, I, I don't want to really. Pardon? I don't want to take steroids, doctor. Sorry, really, I don't want them. May I know why? Because I'm very, uh, I'm very self-concerned uh, about my body image and I really don't want to gain any weight. Okay, we will use, uh, as I tell you, we will use the minimum, uh, the minimal dose to, uh, to control your disease and we will involve the dietitian. Uh, so as to, to, uh, to minimize this side effect as, as much as possible. And, to, and uh, uh, you, if you, you, take, uh, you care about your body image, I, 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 I remind you about the deformity which can a result from the disease on your hands and in joints. I'm so sorry to tell you about that again. But you said that there is another treatment available, right? Why don't you give me that? Okay. Uh, every 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 uh, drug has its own its its side effect, and as I tell you, the consultant has decided to start you on steroid on the best interest of your condition. Uh, and I will arrange a meeting with, you, with my consultant uh, to discuss with you all the medication available and the options, um, so as to help you regarding this issue. Is 
necesitado que yo digo? Well, uh, okay, doctor, I'm okay with any other treatment, but not steroids. I, I'm, I'm not going to take steroids. I'm sorry. I'm taking Panadol so far, and although it's not working, but um, that's it. I'm, I'm not keen to start steroids. Uh, okay, I understand your, uh, your 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 opinion, and as I told, I will I will arrange uh, another meeting with my consultant. He will be in a better con in a better position to convince you. Okay, Miss uh, Miss Charlotte. Well. Okay, but he's. I'm not going to change my mind, doctor. I don't want steroids. Do you have any uh, other reason apart from uh, weight gain? No, that's it. I, I'm I'm not f comfortable to to start steroids. If there is any other treatment, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, there is other treatment available as I tell as I uh, and my consultant uh, is considering starting this, but not at this stage. Uh, but not at this stage of uh, the disease. Okay. Uh, and if if you start oh, and and uh, the steroid will be also part of the, of uh, this disease modifying drugs. Okay. So what do you feel now about it? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm... Um, I don't know, doctor. I'm not keen to start this kind of treatment, and I'll think about it. Maybe I'll think about it. Okay, we will arrange another meeting uh, to discuss it in, uh, uh, more. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, may I ask you uh, some questions, if you don't mind? Yes. Uh, what do you do for a living, Miss uh, Charlotte? I am a chef. And how, how and how the disease is affecting you in your uh, occupation? Well, it's really troublesome, you know, doctor. Uh, my hands are so painful. You know, I've been working so hard to reach this level. Um, I work in a five-star restaurant, in one of the most important restaurants in London, and. Um, you know, it's very challenging to keep up to the level with this troublesome disease. My my hands are painful, and uh, I'm afraid that that may affect my job. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, you can you can uh, contact the occupational health in your uh, work, and he may allocate you in other uh, positions. Is that okay? Excuse me. You can contact the, the occupational uh, therapist in your occupational health worker in your uh, in your uh, restaurant, and he can allocate you in another position. But I don't want to change my position. I can't still work, although it's painful. But I can still do my job. <laughs> Uh, okay, that's why we are, we are encouraging you to start the disease the, the medication so as to help you uh, avoid the, this uh, pain and and inflammation of your joint and to avoid the future deformity uh, so as you can continue with your job. Okay, uh, Miss Charlotte, are you married? Yes. Uh, do you have kids? Not yet. Are you planning uh, pre for pregnancy? Yeah. 
Uh, okay. Uh, if, uh, if, when we start this medication, please uh, let, us, let us know if you are planning pregnancy uh, so as to contact your woman doctor and be planned pregnancy because some of this medication may have a bad effect on your baby. Uh, is that okay? Hello? 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 Do you hear me? Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes, okay. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello. Your voice is interrupted. Yes, send a message to me. Hello. Anybody, can you can you doctors who are listening to us can you hear me? Yes, but your voice is interrupted. What what now? Yes, uh, much better now. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. So, can you see the slide? Yes. All right. So, uh, continue, doctor. Okay, we stop at the point of pregnancy. Yeah? Yes, yes. I told you that uh, when we start this medication, please tell us if you, if you are planning for pregnancy. Uh, so, as to contact your woman doctor and plan for this, because some of these uh, drugs may have a bad effect on your fetus, on your baby. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, right. uh, Ms. Charlotte, with whom you do, uh, you are living? Uh, I live with my husband. Okay, so are you uh, so you are uh, uh, financially supported? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you smoke, Ms. Charlotte? So sorry to ask you about that. Yes, I do. How many cigarettes per day? For how long? Um, ten. Ten cigarettes a day. I've been smoking for five years. Okay, Ms. Charlotte. Uh, smoking may, uh, may have uh, a bad effect on your health and uh, your disease. Uh, so, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I will ask you, I will uh, refer you for a smoke cessation clinic uh, to help you stop smoking. Okay? Okay. Do you drink alcohol? Uh, sometimes, just socially. Okay. Um, okay, Miss uh, Charlotte. Uh, uh, do you have any other concern or uh, questions for me? Uh, yeah, doctor. Do I need? Is it important to tell my employer that I have rheumatoid arthritis? So far, no need so far, for so far to tell the, your employer. Um, but you can contact the occupational uh, department in your occupational health department to help you cope, cope with your disease. Okay. So you mean I don't, do I have to tell them? Yes, please, to help you, just to help you with uh, your uh, uh, disease. Is it a must or can I do it for myself? What? Is it a must or can I keep it for myself? National Health Office or can I keep it to myself? 
it's it's not a must, but it's uh, advisable. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? No. Okay. So, uh, can you tell me uh, what what have you uh, understand from our meeting today? That uh, because I have rheumatoid arthritis, I must start a new a treatment to receive treatment for my hands. Uh, but um, you will check if there is another treatment to be given to me other than steroid. And um, that um, if I decided to get pregnant, I have to tell my doctor about that beforehand. And um, uh, that um, I will try to contact my occupational health office if I had any problems with my hands. Okay, that's good, uh, Ms. Charlotte. Uh, please, I, I will give you my contact, my, my hospital contact number. Please feel free uh, to contact me at any time uh, if you have any concern or questions. And we will have uh, another appointment uh, with my consultant to discuss with you uh, the, the, about starting this medication uh, and, the, and their side effects and everything you want to know about. Uh, okay. Meanwhile, uh, I will advise you to uh, stop smoking uh, and will give you uh, the Society for Rheumatoid Arthritis so as to, uh, so to see how other people are coping with this disease. Uh, and, the, and I will give you some leaflets about this disease and the medication to read, to read about so as to um, change your, mouth, your mind about the steroid and the, and the, and the side effects. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Okay. Uh, what are the ethical principles in this scenario? Uh, the ethical principle are the autonomy. The, uh, the, the patient has the right to know everything about the disease and the management plan. Uh, the beneficiaries uh, to start the. the disease modifying drug as soon as possible to try to avoid the, the side effect, the complication from thyroid arthritis. Not, yes. not, do, not, doing, not, not doing bad for the patient, um, but by not delaying the, the medication. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, you did well, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'll tell you but just some few points. Okay, just some few po uh, points just to give you a feedback. When she said that she doesn't want to take steroids, all right, you asked her why, and so and you explained the side effect of the steroids and that she will be given the minimal dose, and she was refusing. Whatever you did, she was refusing. Offer a second opinion, okay, you can do that. Maybe she wants to discuss about steroid with your uh, consultant. And then she asked you, if there is an alternative, I will start it. So you, you say that you will discuss this with your consultant and see if uh, that is possible or not. All right. You will, because the, usually the consultant is the one who starts the uh, disease modifying agents. Or an explanation about the importance of, and then if she was asking for alternatives, ask her because because here it's mentioned that he's also considering disease modifying agents, as she already has eight to ten joints affected. Okay, although not severe severely. So here, tell, when she asks about an alternative, tell her that you will discuss this with your consultant. Then explain what these alternative drugs are. Like methotrexate, explain the indication, the side effect of the drug, okay? The complications um, that she needs, what the effect of methotrexate on pregnancy, as you said. Ask her if she is planning to get pregnant soon, if she is on contraception right now. We will discuss the possibility of starting methotrexate with your consultant, all right? Um, you solved her concerns well, uh, her job issue, her, you gave her uh, advices, okay? So uh, reassure her that if she 
start treatment, her symptoms will be controlled and that uh, her, her work it will help her even Work. The symptoms, the pain, the stiffness will improve. She will be better. You, but uh, if she's a medical society group, any sort group, there are other. I give her contact details of the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, if she needs, if she needed any help to contact them. Okay, give her contact details of your clinic, your special specialist nurse, um, and then the written information, the websites, the pamphlets and leaflets, and so on. Okay. Uh, you did well, very well. Thank you very much. Uh, we will stop here tonight, okay, um, because of the poor connection. However, uh, tomorrow is going to be off, all right? Uh, there is no course tomorrow, and we will continue on Thursday, okay? Uh, we will send you the uh, re a clear recorded uh, uh, lectures and um, just if you have any questions please send me a message now you can ask me if you have uh, anything to ask okay but we finished for today okay Dr. Renata, please yes uh, what about the question of uh, is she supposed to tell her uh, employer about her condition? How should I, I answer yes. the question? If she advised her, if she faced any difficulty.
Okay, regarding the answer of the question, uh, it's up to her to tell her employer or not, okay? As long as um, there is no breaching confidentiality needed here. If she needs help, advise her to contact her occupational health office. If she doesn't need help, then there is no need to tell her employer, okay? It's up to her. If she wants to, it's okay. If she doesn't want to, it's okay. All right? So we'll stop here. Sorry for the interruption. The connection was very weak tonight. Uh, we'll stop her. Uh, thank you and good night.